Caster's Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, in terms of the technology today, you're not going to be on camera, you might be relieved to know. Um, the audio is working and teams are working, but we have a slight problem with the cameras working. So it doesn't affect the way we have the meeting, just raise your hand, um, as you always have done if you'd like to speak. So, as we always do with this meeting, it would be great to do introductions for people that haven't been before, um, when it's your turn, and we do like a Mexican wave and go round, but you don't have to stand up and put your hands in the air, it's absolutely fine. Um, just press the big red button and then just say who you are and what organisation you're from, and then we know everybody's in the room. So, I'll start, I'm Councillor Rachel Blake, I'm a Cabinet Member for Children's Social Care Inequalities and Chair of this Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, and that looks the easier way to go around, so we'll start with Amber. Okay, I'm Amber Torrington. I'm a Governance Officer taking the minutes of the meeting today. Uh, morning, everyone. I'm Richard Parker. I'm Chief Executive at Doncaster and Bassett Lord Teaching Hospitals. Morning, everybody. I'm Anthony Fitzgerald. I'm Executive Place Director for NHS South Yorkshire, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm Councillor Leeds Bull, Cabinet Member for Public Health, Culture, Communities and Leisure. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel. I'm from Health Watch Doncaster. I'm an administrator. Morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Bosmans. I'm the Chair of Health Watch Doncaster. Sean, I'm from Health Watch Doncaster. Natalie Bowles, Smith, Health Watch Doncaster. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jo Forrestall. I um, work for NHS South Yorkshire. Morning, Wendy Sharps, uh, Living Well with Dementia, and I'm co-chair of Dementia Collaborative. Morning, good morning. Uh, my name's uh, Phil Barge. Uh, I'm on the strategy group uh, for Doncaster Council. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. My name's Mark Wakefield. I'm the uh, head of service for Strategic Commission in uh, Doncaster City Council. Morning, everybody. My name's Councillor Glynis Smith for the Hatfield Ward. Good morning, everybody. Councillor Cynthia Ransom for the Spotbury Ward. Okay. <laughs> morning, everyone. Nabil Al Cindy. I'm a GP and I'm Place Medical Director for Doncaster at uh, NHS South Yorkshire. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Holmes. I'm Director of Adults, Wellbeing and Culture in the Council. Mike McBurney, um, Strategic Commissioner in Doncaster Council. Um, hello everyone, I'm Pauline Dunn, I'm Chair, Secretary and Trustee of the Doncaster and District Deaf Society. Hello, I'm Callum Hellman, Transformation Manager, Doncaster Council. Good morning, Martin Owen, Head of Service for Sound Transformation, Doncaster Council, Children, Young People and Families. Good morning, Emma Price, Head of Transformation and Joint Starting Well Lead at the ICB in Doncaster. Morning everyone, my name is Alan Wiltshire, um, Head of Policy, Performance Intelligence at the Council. Hi, I'm Hayley Waller, Policy Insight and Change, Doncaster Council. Morning, I'm Rio Overton Bullard, Public Health Improvement Officer at Doncaster Council. Good morning, I'm Vanessa Powell Highland, Public Health Lead at Doncaster Council. Morning, Karen Seaman, uh, Public Health Improvement Coordinator, part of the World Doncaster team. Morning, everyone. Louise Robson, Public Health Lead here at Doncaster Council. Hello, I hope you're all really impressed with my timing. Just walking in, just as I have to introduce myself. I'm Dave Richmond, I'm Chief Exec at St. Ledger. <coughs> so I think that's everybody except David. Morning everyone, Councillor David Everett from Edenthorpe and Kirk Sandwell Ward. Okay, so that's great um, and welcome everybody. Um, the way we run this meeting is that we obviously have members of the board who are official members and then we have um, other people that have joined the meeting today. Um, everybody's contribution is welcome, so even if you are here for just one item but you have a point to make, please feel free to, to make that point. Absolutely delighted today that we have Pauline returning um, and Pauline is on the agenda to give us an update, a progress update report on the issues that she raised in terms of Doncaster and British Sign Language. 
and delighted as well that we have Wendy and Phil um, from who are going to be talking about the, uh, the dementia strategy. So really welcome to everybody. Um, and I have explained it is an informal meeting, even though it's a very formal setting. So I then now have to do the formal bits. Um, so apologies for day, today's meeting have been received from Dr. Rupert Sucklin, Councillor Sarah Smith and Lucy Robertshaw. Do we have any other apologies? No, okay. Vanessa? Oh, Rachel Leslie as well, thank you. And I don't think we've got any substitutes attending today, have we, either? Okay, welcome. So this is the bit I do have to read out. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber. When you have left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAST beyond the fountain. I would like to inform any members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded. Yeah. By audio, no visual, audio recorded. By entering the council chamber, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. I hope that's okay. Item two is Chair's announcements. I've already made my announcements in terms of welcoming everybody. And item three, exclusion of the press and public. There are no items on today's agenda where the press and public are to be excluded. For people who haven't attended before, this is a public meeting. Um, and so our next item, public questions, we have um, a maximum of 15 minutes, we often go over where it's an opportunity for any members of the public or elected members to ask questions or make statements that are related to any item of business on the agenda for today's meeting. So are there any elected members? I don't think we've got any members of the public attending today's meeting who wish to put a question to the board. I've got just one from Cynthia. Okay, yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, in my ward, I have um, two residents who feel very aggrieved about the fact that they can't um, contact an NHS um, dentist. Um, I have sort of sorted this problem out, but I don't know whether it's a common problem in Doncaster. Um, I have to say that the, the health officials have been helpful once I've put them into that place, but it, it is quite a problem for them and they were quite distressed about it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Can Councillor Ranson. And um, sorry that you're um, con <laughs> I, I, I having, I having that experience. I'm afraid that um, that's not uncommon um, at the moment in terms of access to dentistry services. Um, we are. Um, across South Yorkshire and nationally, there is, a, there is an issue about accessing um, NHS dentistry. We have, at NHS South Yorkshire, have taken on the responsibility for commissioning NHS dentistry now um, from, from NHS England um, from, from April. And part of my first job has been to get out there and have a real look at dentistry. The contract is, is, is an interesting one that makes it quite difficult to, uh, for patients who haven't previously been registered to get onto um, to, 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 to dentistry um, registers, but we are looking at ways of doing that, particularly about cutting the waiting lists um, for, for that uh, element of it. Now there is, there is still urgent and emergency access for patients who need, to, um, who need to get on there, but it's the routine work that we need to look at reducing the waiting, li waiting list for, and we've got a, a number of ideas on how we might, on how we might do that. I've talked to um, to uh, Councillor Blake, and we would like to have a focus of dentistry at one of our health and wellbeing boards, hopefully before before the end of the year, um, in in November, where we can bring um, some of our experts to tell us some of the work that we're that, that we're doing and trying to reduce that. Meanwhile, if you do have any experience of of constituents who are struggling, I'm happy to uh, for that to be forwarded to me, and we can look at it. Thank you very much. I've got Andrew from Health. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I, I believe from my colleagues only yesterday we were compiling a dental list and there are no practices that we know of in Doncaster at the moment that are taking on NHS patients. And uh, this seems to be a fundamental problem, uh, probably nationwide, but certainly in Doncaster, that patients are uh, asking us and uh, we're trying our best to try and facilitate that through social media and other areas uh, that we're able to access to get uh, the awareness out there which practices are taking on NHS patients, but it appears to be uh, a very, very poor uh, response from dentists at the moment, presumably because the lists are so full. Okay, so what used to happen, and I'm going back a little bit, not that far, but a little bit, is that there used to be a central number that you could ring and within the NHS and they would be able to tell you with that day where there were any um, dentists that would take you on. Does that still exist? Anthony? Are you coming? Not really. Um, I think it's more a conversation with the individual uh, dentistry. I, I welcome the work from Health Watch, actually, Andrew, because I think that is the, exactly the sort of intelligence um, that we've been trying to gather, and it'd be good to uh, to marry that to to marry that up. Um, I think, as well as the uh, as well as the focus here at the Health and Wellbeing Board, what we're wanting to do is a bit of a, a summit across uh, Doncaster in particular, but maybe across South Yorkshire, that looks at that looks at actually what patients can expect from, from NHS dentistry and some of the schemes that we are running to increase access. As a quick example, sorry, um, we, are, we are looking at uh, incentivising um, a number of uh, practices across South Yorkshire and Doncaster to take on new patients, to take on um, patients who've been waiting a significant length of time um, through a series of action, uh, access schemes. So we will st we'll start to communicate that um, soon and people should start to make a difference. What I should say is this is a little bit around the margins of a whole national focus that we need to have around dentistry. Um, nationally, they're in publication at the moment, we haven't seen it yet, will be a um, recovery access plan for dentistry, much like we saw for general practice. Um, so that's in the wings and we'd need to respond to that as well. Andrew. Yes, thank you again, Chair. Yes, uh, we welcome uh, to be able to work with uh, with anybody along uh, with that piece of work. Um, uh, my colleagues in the office uh, are doing their very best to make the awareness as widespread as possible, but we do need to be able to uh, solve some of these fundamental problems. I mean, obviously, uh, we've got councillors coming today, and it's grassroots level that where people are probably in pain. I know there's an emergency service, but, uh, you know, the waiting list just for a fundamental checkup. I mean, for me, it was f uh, nine months I had to wait for just for a normal checkup. Uh, and it's and that's you know it's getting beyond the normal six month checkup that you wouldn't reasonably expect and that's just my experience of dental practices so obviously it is uh, a fundamental problem and we really need to be able to uh, signpost people which is part of our job to the right uh, practice at the right time especially in emergency situations which we do okay so I've got thank you for that question Cynthia so that's generated two actions so it will come to the note November health and well-being board nodded for Louise thank you but if health watch then can supply that data and be on the agenda as well in terms of starting with the lived experience I think that would be really useful sorry yes we do keep records and we'll be happy to supply with that data so if, uh, if the gentleman would like to speak to my colleagues who are here today then they're happy to liaise with him Okay, so we'll leave that with you, Anthony. Is that okay? Uh, may I ask, may of course I ask you another can one? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is actually one for uh, Richard, I would believe. Um, in the case of the Lucy Letby uh, situation, has Doncaster put any extra procedures in place? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. So I think the challenge that we have with the Lucy Letby case is um, is the first one is how abhorrent it, it is in terms of the acts that were committed against uh, babies and their families and obviously people have reacted to that with initial thoughts on what the circumstances were and clearly there's been a lot of focus around freedom to speak up and um, and also the regulation of hospital um, managers I think if you stood back and looked at the case, the three senior managers um, in Chester were actually all regulated, being members of professions. So the medical director was regulated by the GMC, 
um, chief nurse by the NMC and uh, the chief executive was always a, also a nurse by professional background and at that time I'm not sure whether he was or wasn't on the register. So whilst those are obvious things to concentrate on, I think as the public inquiry unfolds, there'll be a number of different circumstances that we need to address. As a hospital, we had freedom to speak up arrangements in place, and we were looking at those in terms of correspondence we received from NHS England about fit and proper persons, and the appointment process for senior members and senior colleagues. Um, and that continues, and those will have to be implemented by the end of uh, September. So um, those are in place and, uh, and being strengthened. What we're also going to do is take a look at what we know about the case already and whether there are things that we can immediately do outside of the public inquiry to make sure that governance reporting, the way in which we respond to certain uh, issues that are raised with us are robust open and transparent so that there's always a record and there's a decision-making process. So at the moment, we're looking at it, what we know and what's in the public arena. We're looking at it in terms of what we can change. And obviously, we'll be um, minded to be very thoughtful about um, any other information that emerges in, um, in the public domain. I personally think there'll be a number of different actions that are wider than just the issue at the minute of freedom to speak up and regulation of managers. I think there'll be a number of issues around how we do and handle and share information and data. And as I said, what we do in certain circumstances. I mean, as tragic as this is, thankfully, um, the number of cases of this nature are small. But that makes it even more important that when they are small, that our governances, our processes are as robust and solid as we can make them. We will update our board in September in terms of initial thoughts and initial actions. And then clearly we'll keep it under review as the uh, public inquiry uh, develops. Is that okay, Cynthia? Thank you, Glynis. Yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to say that um, I attended the joint South Yorkshire meeting for as the chair of health and adult social care uh, at the town hall in Sheffield to discuss the NHS joint forward plan. Um, we talked about the, consult the consultation, which um, the figures for the whole of South Yorkshire are less than 1%. Should we really be calling these things consultations when so few people actually, you know, are consulted? And um, what attempts are being made to uh, make this consultation understandable, readable, anything for our vulnerable adults, our confused elderly, people with dementia. We seem to me to be excluding from the start huge percentages of our population. And when the figures are so awful, I really wonder how we can call it a consultation. Thank Thanks, Glyn. So I'll bring in Anthony, but I know one of the actions from the last meeting was that Health Watch were commissioned to do some work in Doncaster about the engagement. So um, I've not seen an update from that. So if, if a verbal update could be given about the consultation that happened and with who in Doncaster. Yes, I'm too bothered, Glynis, about the 1%, but I'm, I'm more focused on the engagement that's taken place in Doncaster to make sure our residents get their views. So is that okay, Anthony, and then Health Watch? Thank you. Yeah, I could probably I could probably help with a second as well, actually, because that was discussed at our Doncaster Place Committee um, on Friday. We're talking about the Joint Forward Plan consultation, are we? Yeah, yeah. Um, point taken. That's not a great response rate, rate is it? And um, yeah, definition of consultation, I guess, is a, is an interesting one for that. It's disappointing because I, I, I'd previously updated the board that. Um, the consultation process and the engagement process for the integrated care partnership strategy, I believe, was a good one. I think it, I th I think it had um, many different ways of doing things. I think the materials um, that were that were out there were, were good. Um, I think the response rates were certainly a lot higher than the, the, than that was, and the, and the reach as such. So, I will take that back um, to, to 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 the to the ICB board and um, and um, make those points known that perhaps we didn't use the same methodology as spread as what we had for the integrated care partnership strategy which i felt was a good was it was a good approach so i'll, I'll take that back um 
to the Doncaster um, approach, we um, we had an update. We, 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 we didn't have quite spend as much time on it as we wanted to um, on Friday, but what partners have done across Doncaster is, is committed to come together about what is our one methodology um, for um, user experience, for engagement with our with with, with our residents and um, and consultation, using those terms. Sorry, a bit inter intertwined. I know I shouldn't, um, but I think there is a, a good commitment for partners to do that. And um, yes, Health Watch are involved in, involved in, in in that work, and I think it has great potential. Again, I think given that we had a presentation back here earlier on in the year, didn't we about um, user experience and our ways of doing things, perhaps we could bring that back and show some of the progress that is being made. Did you want to? If I can slightly expand on how the consultation actually worked. Um, forgive me. Um, the consultation worked in terms of the joint forward plan. We were tasked with um, certain communities to speak with as well. So there was a lot more um, to do in terms of it wasn't just a case of hitting um, a figure of consultation numbers um, there was a specific focus on meeting different communities so I guess there's a lot more to the joint forward plan than perhaps um, once you dig beneath the surface of it so I, I take your points on board in terms of figures and consultation um, but as Anthony referenced we are working with um, strategic leaders in Doncaster in terms of how we can co-produce and engage better together and um, we do recognize that there's always been a shortfall in engagement but we, we are working in the joint forward plan uh, did um, communicate what we hoped to communicate and we did um, I think 15 focus groups which, which was the highest amount of focus groups across South Yorkshire and Doncaster we really really did tip engagement at, to the fullest um, across the um, coordinated work with all the other health watchers so I think from a health watch perspective we were successful in what we achieved Sorry, Angie, it would be really useful just if we could have that, because it was in the notes that we were actually going to get quite a detailed report about which communities were engaged with yeah. and what the outcomes were for Doncaster, because I think what we don't want to do is duplicate your efforts in the consultation that we're doing. Absolutely. I'm just going to bring in Nigel. Cause yeah, thanks, I, I don't, Obviously, I don't want to labour it, I mean, but, but we had a, a June meeting on the 8th of June, and we, we raised these concerns back then. So we make these concerns perfectly clear around consultation because there's been previous consultation took place where um, in terms of the ICB, I mean, there were only 500 respondents throughout South Yorkshire. The, the, the issue is is that you cannot call under any, any way, um, s scope or whatever, you can't call 1% um, an active consultation. So this issue has been raised and, and it's been raised again at this meeting. And, and one of the actions were, were that effectively you, you were going to feed it back to ICB and then you were going to come back later in the year with a, with a further update. Um, clearly, the consultation strategy is not working effectively. That's what I'll, I learned from this, in fairness. And obviously, in terms of Councillor Smith and her updating us from that meeting she had in Sheffield, it's continuing not to work. So there needs to be sort of like a, a radical redrawing of that policy and that strategy to actually ensure that positive consultation takes place because this is a second meeting three months on that we've raised concerns about this again and my guess is a November meeting is, is, is just a guess it may not be even any better Thank you did anybody want to respond to that Andrew? Yes yeah um, it's, um, it's a fundamental difficulty as far as Healthwatch is concerned in being able to uh, compile this sort of data in that we're a, a lim we have limited resources and a limited team. Um, we are, as best we can, to doing those consultations. It seems that all the emphasis is being put back on Healthwatch Doncaster. Uh, and this, this is the team, effectively, apart from the chief executive. And we're, we're doing our best under the circumstances. But I think there's another fundamental problem is, yes, we, we can go out into communities, we can consult, and we have been doing, and, and uh, it has been mentioned, and the team works as hard as it possibly can to, to get that information. But it's, it's the fundamental problem as well that people are not coming back to us and giving us the information. And, and as I said, I, and I agree with Nigel, 1% is a very, very small number, but it's getting people to respond as well as going out there and finding the people to respond. 
Okay. And we do have fundamental resource issues in being able to, to, to people that on the, in the longer term. Give us the funds and we'll do the job definitely. Just to clarify then, so I don't think anybody is expecting that Health Watch do all the consultation. My ask was that we were told at the last meeting that Health Watch had done consultation and they would send us the outcome of that consultation. And the reason we wanted that, because across the council and other partners, we do ongoing consultation. And we saw that as an opportunity to build on what you were doing so we didn't duplicate. And then perhaps looking at Phil and others in terms of locality working, Joe's nodding, we can look at what we're doing already and then have a comprehensive picture. So I think that was our expectation, not that we expect Health Watch to do all the consultation. I'll ensure that you get their figures. I think it's not just the figures, it's about locations. Yeah, We've absolutely. got a number of elected members in the room today. Yeah. You know, they have surgeries, for instance, they have different community groups. So if we are talking about engaging with different groups, we have people in the room that can help with that. I'm looking at Nabil in terms of GP's practices. You know, collectively between us in a week, we probably engage with thousands of people. So if it's just a question of asking certain questions, I'm sure we can all contribute to understanding and, and, and getting that figure way past 1%, certainly in Doncaster anyway. As I say, we can't control the rest of South Yorkshire. Nabil. Yeah, just to, um, to weigh in on that, if you look at the actual breakdown, there's only 120 who've completed an online feedback survey, which, you know, is, you know, really, really low. So I know it's obviously good that a lot of that outreach has been done in person. You can see that from the group numbers, the face-to-face um, -face surveys, but that's clearly a, a missed opportunity for all the ways we communicate with our patients and our residents, you know, through online things, putting it on the end of council email, you know, the council bulletins that come out, what we send out as as practices with text messages, all sorts of ways you can do it. I think we have to take that back as a whole system about how we've um, consulted, engaged on the on this process, and it clearly hasn't worked as it should. Okay, thank you for that, and I think you're right. I mean, the council sends out an email to, I don't know if anybody knows, is it 30,000 people, 300,000 people, I don't know. There's an awful lot of people that get that, get that email every Friday. And if only 1% responded, it would help, wouldn't it? So, so the action then that I can understand is that we're going to get the detail of the consultation that's taken place. Um, Anthony, you're going to provide information in terms of um, that combined approach to user engagement, resident engagement. And then I think collectively we're bringing it back to the November meeting to look at we can have that, that whole systems approach to make sure that certainly for Doncaster, the figure goes way beyond 1%. Is that okay, Glynis? Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Pauline, yes. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I would just like to add that pre-COVID, the Doncaster Deaf Society had a good relationship with Health Watch through Sandy Hodgson. We were not even aware that Sandy had left until I bumped into it at some conference. But the Deaf Society, who covers advocacy work, mental health and well-being of the BSL user, um, we've never been approached by Health Watch after COVID. No one has been in touch with us to find out our views, the views of all our BSL users. And I just think that is um, really a little bit missing when they say they cover communities, they're not in touch with the Deaf Society. We cover 500, 600 mem BSL members living in Doncaster. One way or another, we do get to know what's happening on a wider scale than anyone else. So it would be nice to have um, Health Watch approach us uh, so that we can discuss the issues that we have okay. with health. But having said that now, I think coming here at the last the meeting in March, there's been a lot of progress since then been meeting with the NHS and the council officers. Okay, thanks very Thank much, you. Pauline. Did you want to come back? Yeah, so Pauline, I do believe we've had an email exchange, myself, Natalie Bowlesmith, and I do believe you've met with our Chief Operating Officer as well, Fran Joel. No, I haven't met with Fran Joel yet. Um, and it was me who approached Health Watch after bumping into Sandy Hodgson to say, you know, what's happening with Health Watch? You know, we don't hear anything from them. And I said, oh, I have left. 
this is the person to write to on that email yourself. Yeah. Okay. Well, so sorry, but we, we're running over time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So can I ask that we take that out of Absolutely. the meeting? And if you could just take your thing off, thank you. Take that out of the meeting and make those connections. That would be appreciated. Um, okay. So that ends the public meeting and the public part of the agenda, unless anybody else wishes to speak. No, thank you very much then. And I think uh, Amber has noted all those actions. Thank you. So item five is declaration of interest. Does anyone have a disclosable pecuniary interest or other interest to declare in relation to the business on today's agenda? If people do, then obviously please speak to Amber and complete that form. Can't see anybody that does, so we will move on. Item six, minutes of the last meeting. Um, the minutes of the board's last meeting are attached at page one of the agenda papers and the board is asked to consider and approve these as a correct record. Can we agree the minutes as a true and accurate record? Move it, okay. Um, um, we've already covered some of the outstanding actions. So moving on to um, our presentations, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I would like to change the order of business on today's agenda by bringing forward item number 12, the team Doncaster Dementia Strategy. And we've got Wendy and Phil in attendance alongside Mark and Joe. Um, so. I am going to ask them to do a presentation in any way that they want to. Um, you have about 30 minutes. We always say leave half of that time for questions because we like to ask lots. Um, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, whilst um, the presentation is coming up, just to give you a bit of an overview of what we'll be doing today, is just to share some insight in terms of how the um, strategy was formed and the groups and individuals who are involved in that and that's why Wendy and uh, Phil are here today. And what we're seeking is um, endorsement of the strategy and the priorities that are contained uh, within it. Um, so in terms of the first slide, I think the, the first thing to say is that there are um, two key groups that have been involved in shaping the strategy and the work leading up to that. One being the uh, Doncaster Dementia Collaborative convened in 2021. Um, essentially um, a multi-agency um, group of individuals, including crucially people with lived experience and, and people that are caring for people uh, living with uh, d dementia. Um, and they lobby and support uh, local positive change for uh, people experiencing um, dementia. The second group is the Dementia Strategy Group, and that, that sort of fell out of the collaborative. Um, and they, uh, that group, again, um, has got a, a, a varied representation, and it's an opportunity for people with lived experience to um, engage with health and social services um, in terms of the, the development of the strategy, the priorities, and crucially in the next phase will be around the development of the delivery plans and the actual doing of the strategy. Um, back in 2022, Health Watch were commissioned by um, the Council and uh, Health to undertake a piece of engagement in preparation for the expiry of some contracts uh, delivering the dementia pathway in Doncaster. And the idea around that was to just tease out people's experiences of that pathway and, and identify what was working well and maybe what wasn't working so well. Um, and you'll see there that there were a, a number of themes that came up. So one was around it, it being a particularly complex or feeling like a, a complex system. That tied into things like the, the length of time to receive a diagnosis, um, a lack of information, or, or perhaps um, the information that was there wasn't perhaps widely, there wasn't an awareness of, of the existence of, the, of, of that information. A lack of support following um, diagnosis, and a bit of a disjointed um, a, a arrangement. And running through that was um, the health inequalities um, dimension. You'll see that there was over 250 people that responded to that engagement. So following that, um, the Dementia Strategy Group considered that feedback and um, earlier this year there was a, a, a piece of work, a, a survey undertaken to build on that. And the idea around that was to help start to shape what the strategy needs to cover off in terms of priorities and to inform the development of the specifications for the services that have been reprocured. And I'll come on to that on a different slide uh, very shortly. You'll, you'll see there that there was over 400 uh, responses from uh, people with dementia, carers and, and family, and uh, 37 uh, responses from other stakeholders. And um, so th the outcome of that was about the strategy priorities. So you'll see there's, there's five priorities. I say five, one of them is, 
has got a number of cross-cutting themes. But um, essentially, information advice and guidance, so that is about good quality, accessible information advice and guidance, and crucially about people being aware of where that advice and guidance is, and, and Your Life Doncaster is the platform which that uh, work is taking place on. There's the diagnosis um, element, and that's around um, identifying where the diagnosis rates can be improved in terms of the um, waiting list delays, etc. Support following diagnosis, which is uh, obviously critical, and again, that ties back to the advice, information, and guidance, and that's around having a breadth of offer um, based in our localities, so drawing on the assets and strengths within our localities and, and building on where there might be um, gaps or areas to, to develop to make sure that there is a, a broad offer, um, not just for individuals um, living with dementia, but particularly around carers, and that's why the uh, carers and family is the, is the fourth priority. As I said, there's a cross-cutting theme, um, that's around making sure that we cover off adequately health inequalities and cover um, underrepresented groups in all the work that we're doing. Dignity and compassion, which is a, again a theme that runs across not just dementia services but more broadly. Workforce, around making sure that we've got an adequately skilled and trained workforce. Um, data, so uh, we can see exactly how we're improving in terms of key performance uh, indicators. Crucially, that's to run alongside the lived experience, because I think that's the main thing with all of this. It's about what this means to people and how it's improving their experiences. And then co-production. So the idea with those cross-cutting themes is that they will be a lens that the other four themes will, will um, be um, uh, informed by. What I propose to do now is hand over to Wendy and uh, Phil, who will share some of their experiences of living or caring for people with um, dementia, and then maybe just share a bit of insight in terms of your involvement in the collaborative and the strategy and the work to date. Thank you. Hello, uh, good morning, I'm Phil. I'd just like to go through a little bit of history, uh, again, as I'm going through all this, my, my life at the moment. But uh, earlier this year, uh, I completed a survey which uh, the council had done the dementia survey. And as Mark says, there were over 400 residents responded to that. Uh, there was also an advert uh, which I noticed that uh, they were looking for people to join the strategy group within the council. And I duly applied for that because I didn't know a lot about dementia at all, how many people had it, whatever, what was involved. Unfortunately, I, mean, I was very fortunate to be asked to join this, this, this strategy group, which I've been uh, with them since uh, March, really. I was also in June uh, when the tenders went out uh, for the pre-project pre dementia, pre-post and pre-post diagnostic service. I was on the tendering panel for that as well, where... Uh, or the, the people who were quoted for it were asked a variety of questions and the group uh, challenged them on what their responses were. And uh, that's where I was left there. Uh, and, to, and, uh, and it was a very, very good and fair assessment of what was being offered by these two, two, out, these two companies or systems. I didn't realise really how many people had dementia, which I've just mentioned. And apparently there's over 200 different conditions of what could be de and termed under dementia. I don't know what they all are, of course, but uh, that's what they say. On the, uh, so that was it. Uh, and uh, with our family, my wife, she's got, she's got two brothers, and uh, w both have got dementia, and both are in homes. Ken, he died about three months ago. Colin, he's still in there and not in a good way. Within also, uh, my wife's brother in law, he's in a really bad way. He has dementia. He lost his wife some years ago, and as care is coming in, couple of times a week but he's also down to go to a new care home which I understand is being built in Mexborough uh, for people who want to you know, get in what need looking after in homes and he's on the list to be on that and hopefully that'll that building will open quite soon so I didn't so as I say I didn't know too much about the dementia or living with it but early this year I noticed a change in my wife's attitude and the way that she lived and it was really difficult remembering where she'd place things you know she forgot things often become agitated uh, and lose the temper very very quickly now very very quickly indeed uh, she's got short fuse but she forgets about it within five, four or five minutes ten minutes it's all gone and I remind her of simple tasks the comments I made when reminded her that she was wrong but that wasn't the way to go for me for sure definitely wasn't because it all kicked off again my wife, she's one of the quietest people you could ever wish to meet, and she really is. She's a nice girl. She's got some good friends, but she gets frustrated now, or even on the smallest issue, losing her temper very quickly within the household and within the, within the family. 
Uh, but as I say, she soon forgets it. My daughter and her husband, they recognise this change in, in Beryl. And we arrange for a, a, an appointment with the doctor to assess her condition in relation to dementia, which is quite a, a simple one, really, because she was just asked about four or five questions by the doctor to respond. And they were really very, very simple questions, and she, she passed those, but she was all OK on that. Then, then they said, OK, I'll send you for a blood test, send you for a CT scan and whatever else. So that would go, so we're OK, we're on the pathway here. But this was in June of this year. And we waited and waited and waited. We never heard anything back whatsoever else. So a, w a month or so ago, I re rearranged another appointment with the same doctor uh, to carry out another assessment on Beryl. So he did that. But then I said, well, where, what happened to the last set of things? He said, well, so I sent them off. So anyway, we, we also, that, that's where we are. We didn't know where it was, what, whether she was right or whether she was wrong. But we're still experiencing these methods of, of, of her conduct and how, how she was living in the house. She doesn't, she's very, very good with it. So I say he had this short session, this short session with him and again there. But then we got in touch with Alzheimer's disease and a lady called uh, Tarina Scott. So some of you may know Tarina, I don't know. But she visited our house and she said, well, I'll take this on. I'll look at it after Beryl and be careful for her at some stage through the Alzheimer's route. So Tarina, she, she contacted our uh, GP, couldn't get anywhere whatsoever. She was always number five in the queue. Uh, which is consistent really in Donk around our GP practice anyway. But uh, we, we didn't hear anything whatsoever from the, the, our surgery that other than, oh, they'd sent it back from the memory clinic because all the documents weren't there. So, so what other, what is missing? And it was the, the one that, on her blood that was missing, so they automatically send it back to the GP. But they never informed us that she needed another uh, blood test, whatever else. So anyway, last week, and it's spooky this, but last week, uh, the memory care clinic uh, called me, called us up, and the lady called that Sarah was on it, and she's on the collaborative uh, that we have at Wheatley Golf Club. Uh, so anyway, she saw, uh, they found out that they'd misplaced the blood, test, the blood test that she'd had. So from June until this month, there was just, nothing was happening at all. So anyway, she said, well, we've been in touch with them. They have found it. Now, whether it was the first one or the second one, I don't know. But uh, whatever else. So they've said, OK, we'll arrange an appointment for Beryl and get you, get you there, get her in like that. So a, a, general, a general condition is still a concern. And I mean, this morning, she asked me three times what time I was going out and where I was going. You know, so it's that sort of situation that I'm living with. And really, it, it is difficult to keep on track, you know, to agree with Beryl and not to start firing off again. So that's it. So it's still a concern for us, as I say, and every day or so we want to get on this pathway so we can see for Beryl where she can be helped along this route. So the pathway, as I say, should be highlighted as we're going to do in the, in the presentation uh, to everybody. But uh, what, what Wendy and I really want to look for is that we, there's a saying within, that, within our group, adding years of life, life to years for people living with dementia in their carers. And that's what we'd like everybody to be quite favourable on this presentation of where the, the way that uh, the, with the strategy group is heading along with the NA, N, NHS. So thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah. Uh, um, this dementia strategy uh, that we put together um, it, it's like well I got diagnosed when I was 40 um, and it took five years for him to get my diagnosed because same thing were happening um, my CT scans and everything were coming back normal the doctors were saying I was stressed I was depressed I was saying no you're making me stressed and depressed so it were a, a long five years, but then I finally got diagnosed. Uh, but my, my point I'm making is this is, it, it's got to be better for people with dementia. Uh, we, we've got to think for future and it, we've got to have like stop having doctors asking stupid questions like, Wendy, why have you got dementia? 
well, I, I was lucky, I won it in a raffle. And and you're on telephone to a doctor. Um, Wendy, I've just read your notes. It says you've got dementia. It doesn't sound like dementia. Well, what do you want me to sound like? <laughs> and it's like hospitals. I were in hospital and I were on a trolley and I were asking to go to the toilet and the nurse turned around and says, wet you send and I'll change you later. And my daughter flipped out and bless them, two other nurses must have hold of her uh, they came and they get, helped me to the toilet. But that nurse, it well, I it weren't my job. She had no education, no training. And this is that happening since last year. And it, and it's still it's every time you go to an appointment, there's there's a lack of education, there's the lack of compassion, and it's like everybody's got it's not my job it's somebody else's job well everybody's got to do every man and his dog's job you know what i mean we're trying to make our lives better by educating you people and every man to help us live well and and die with dignity in our own homes we don't want to go into care homes if we have to but we've got to have things in place for us to keep living and like carers you can't burn them out they should be offered respite at least once a year to give the carers the respite before they need it you can't put the carers into crisis because they go downhill then the people with dementia has gone downhill and I don't want to end up in a care home when my husband burns out and my daughters burn out I've just got a PA that I've had for seven years and she's leaving because they won't give her a pay rise. She's been on £10.50 for seven years she's been with me. I wanted to put it up by 50p because I have... Um, what's that where they come and help you? Um, a direct payments, sorry. I have direct payments and they've been looking after sorting everything out. But... For 50p, I've lost a good PA and I've got no care now, so I'm going to have to interview. And it's things like this that need to be flexible for people with dementia. But it's all in our strategy. We're moving to the future. And you've got to think, like, we're not just, like, forgetfulness. It's everyday tasks. And we want to do it ourselves with help. And we can do it ourselves with help. But don't burn everybody out. But the help it's not coming quick enough. You come in after the fact and then everybody's fucked. Oh, pardon my French. Sorry. So do you, do you understand the passion where I'm coming from? So that's why I'm fighting for people with dementia and the carers. Because I see for both ends. Because my dad... He had dementia and he lived with me. And my daughter always used to say to me, how can you be so patient with my granddad? Because he's actually saying question hundreds of times. I said, well, to him, it's only the first time he's asked me. So you've got to train people and you've got to educate them just to be on the wavelength as that person. From, from like, I'll give you an example yesterday. I came in today for a meeting on wrong day. So the I were a bit flustered, but you've got to commend your lady at desk because she looked after me and she made me feel comfortable. I got that overwhelming feeling had gone. She were really stuck by me till my lift came. And that's what you need. And you've trained her well and she does need a pat on back. So it's things like that, just little things. And I've rung up before and I don't, don't know what I was talking about, but the young lass on phone, she was brilliant. She says, right, I don't know, but I'll show you somebody who does. And this is the training that I'm on about. So I got through to the right person, even though she didn't know, bless her, she helped me. And this is what we need. Everybody needs to help. I don't know if I've gone off track. But... But yeah, all I'm saying is 
it's important that we put this in place and we hold people accountable for to make us live well with dementia and keep us in our own homes and don't burn carers out like Phil so he can look after his wife. You, you know, that's all we're asking for. We're not asking for gold dust. You know, just please help. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Um, very, very timely that that in, insight. Um, th this slide is just talking about the, the recommissioning that talks about other two services. So the specification was developed alongside the strategy. So the priorities that have been identified through the collaborative and through the strategy develop, uh, delivery group um, uh, were embedded within the the specification. There was a mar market event, uh, event held that had a a, a great um, a attendance. Um, used that as an opportunity to unpack some of the cross-cutting areas. So we had a presentation from Mandy Espy, who's the Health Inequalities Lead. We had a presentation from the localities. Again, th this is a dementia strategy, but this is about making sure that it's embedded in everything that we do, so that we're joining up wherever we can. So the things about uh, advice, information, and guidance, that is critical across the entire piece. But within that, there's a very critical area of, of, of work to do around um, advice, information, and guidance for people living um, with, with dementia. Phil referenced the fact that he was involved in the uh, evaluation process and that they were completed in, in June. And the contract start date is in October. And I think critically, it's the launch of those two services along with the developing delivery plans of this strategy is where we'll, we will get to, Wendy, in terms of your points about it's all right having a strategy, but what we need to be doing is delivering from one day. Can I just say, uh, I were also involved in the tender. tender. And uh, it hasn't the the switch over hasn't gone smoothly, because uh, what's happened now is uh, they've not notified us in writing, so the families are not getting prepared. And we found out. Uh, I think it's the week after the twenty second. I think it might be a Monday is the last day of the daycare that I go to. So we've had no. Um, information from the tender people that put in the bid that got it successful so we don't know um, if there's a young onset dementia piece because because where it's it's we can't be with elderly not that we're knocking elderly it's a different service and it's specialist and this and this is what they've got to I explained that in tender. It's a specialised service for young onset people with dementia and they need to make sure that that service is available and nobody's notified us at all. Uh, so I'm just letting you know it hasn't gone smoothly at the minute. Sorry. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. I, I oh, yeah, myself and Joe will certainly look into that. Um, so in terms of... Um, Sorry, the, ne the next slide, it was just to give you a, a little bit of an insight in terms of the, the priorities and about how the, um, uh, that they will be delivered. So you, you'll see there that across those five priority areas, there are suggested lead agencies and currently we're in discussions to identify individuals, named individuals, who will lead up the, um, uh, the working groups. The idea being that they will own the, the um, d delivery plans alongside people with lived experience to develop those uh, delivery plans and then um, they will uh, report into um, what would what was currently the Dementia Strategy Delivery Group and that will morph into the um, Dementia Partnership Board. So there'll be quarterly updates in there to ensure that people with lived experience have got oversight of the delivery of the, um, of the strategy. And of course, there can be further updates brought to um, Age and Well Board and indeed the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, so just watch next, um, I suppose, so the launch of the strategy is um, alongside um, the new commission services on um, International Day of Elder Peoples, so um, 2nd of October. So we're trying to align things so it sort of all comes together. Um, you're right, the two commission services are due to start and um, we are working through the implementation plan. We have got quite robust um, key performance indicators within that. But equally, we're trying to pull together one dashboard, what pulls together um, all information we have around um, dementia. So that's right into early diagnosis and prevalence rates, but right to outcomes and, and linking all this together. Um, 
What we do also want to do is, as much as um, Wendy and Phil have articulated here, demen dementia is a diagnosis, but we need to embed it into, the, um, especially for our older population, into our wider ageing well services. So how do we le link these services into urgent community response and virtual wards and some of the other areas that we've got to en enable people to remain at home, as, as we've heard that this is what to do. So this is a bit of a continuous, we're not expecting from the... 2nd of October that this will be all singing, all dancing, but we will have um, quite robust um, implementation plans with the new providers of services. We do, however, want to do a 12-month review of this dementia service, so very much do what we did before um, and those 400, population, 400 people responding, so we probably need to think about how we link into the wider conversation about how we engage, because um, this is around dementia, but also how we other parts of the system um, link together. So we expect to do that 12-month review and hopeful that we'll see an improvement of where people have told us where they were um, previously um, and where we are now on the back of the strategy and the new delivery of the services. And that is us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure partners will want to come in some some themes there that I was picking up when um, when Wendy and Phil were talking was around that compassion in terms of the you know the GP training so I'll be looking to Nabil to how we come into that um, about that pathway you know fill your experience of blood tests and I don't want to concentrate on individual issues but how we get that pathway far better because I imagine it's an incredibly worrying time wanting to know and then as you said once you're on the pathway good to hear that somebody from the Alzheimer's Society was then in contact and hopefully that supports there. Education and training came out as a real issue from both of you that we've got to improve that. Um, the direct payments, really sorry to, I'm going to look at Phil, he'll pick that up no doubt. Doubt for an extra 50p an hour, that doesn't seem right to a health and wellbeing system that Wendy's got to lose somebody that's been so important to her. So it'd be good to hear about that. And thank you for the comments, Wendy, about how you rang and somebody was was supportive and compassionate and and knew how to support you properly. And I and I will personally pass on thanks to the staff that have, have, have you've given those. Um, and I'm sure they would really appreciate that. So look into partners. I don't know who wants to start. Nabil, do you want to come in first in terms of GP? Yeah, um, thank, thanks everyone and thanks uh, Wendy and Phil. So just to, to remind you, I'm Nabil, I'm a, I'm a GP in um, Bentley and Sprotborough as well as the medical director for, for Doncaster and the commissioning side of things. So it's always really helpful to hear accounts. So obviously I see lots of patients uh, with dementia, you know, at the start of their journey, midway through um, in that later phase of, of things, but other people don't have that, I guess, that, that honour and privilege to, to be along with people on their journey. I, I picked out a few points similar to what um, Rachel has said, Councillor Blake, sorry. Um, I think we've got designed pathways that can be designed perfectly, but they only work as well as the access into them which you've clearly highlighted about the access into the GP practice and then the access into the other side of the service. And then what happens at those touch points. So when you move from the GP has done the initial assessment, initial investigations and referring on, if that doesn't work seamlessly, what happens next? And that, your, your example of, um, with, with your wife is a clear example of where that hasn't worked well. And then the communication around that wasn't effective. So even if the pathway doesn't work 100%, if the communication is good, you would know that it hasn't worked 100%. The GP would know that it hasn't worked 100%, and our dash would know it hasn't worked 100%, and it wouldn't be left in the ether for those two or three months causing increased distress. And I think as a, as, as a GP, what we see is because as waits for certain services become longer, if we don't hear anything back, we don't know that because there's a problem with the referral, we think that's just the routine routine weight so I think there's there that's not just around um this pathway that's around all sorts of um pathways and actually in Doncaster I don't think we've got our dash colleagues in the room today but actually our dementia diagnosis pathway is really responsive in terms of from when that referral actually gets to the right place in terms of things it works really well compared to um other places so so it's really important that we speak to each other well um and, and learn from that and then sort of moving on to um, Wendy's side, I, I think as a, as a clinician really recognise the, the difficulties when it's the young onset dementia. That's not what's sort of 
focused on in in training that's not our typical when we think of someone with dementia we're not and probably when when you come present yourself to reception or particularly when you're on the phone someone isn't automatically thinking that's an extra need and a, an extra support need and that's clearly something for us to take back in terms of how we um train our um train our staff and i think that that is a recurrent theme whenever we ha hear from anyone with an additional need obviously access is difficult for everyone at the moment because of how the systems are and pressures but when there's an additional need um that compassion is really important that that knowledge and actually because we're so under pressure we want to deal with that and move on to the next thing and actually that's really difficult when you're in the, in the position you are and got those um additional needs and then i think just the last thing i wanted to pick up was just that um you just highlight how important it is when services do change that you're given that notice with plenty of time because we probably when we're in that commissioning side we probably think a service has been in place a new service is coming there's no break in that it's fine but actually as someone who's reliant on that that uncertainty is obviously very distressing Uh, thank you, Nabil. Did um, Joe? Sorry, did uh, Phil, yeah. sorry? Did you want to come back, or did I want to bring Phil in next? What's... It was it was probably just about um, the information sharing and the communication among each other. And um, we have a Doncaster Care record, an integrated Doncaster Care record, and um, for whatever reason, previously dementia services not been part of being able to access some of that robustly, and equally share and I think we need to think about very quickly and I think that's why I'm talking around some of this is not going to be a fix on the 2nd of October because sharing of information is not dead easy but it is on the priority list to start thinking about how we share records for even sort of voluntary um, services that actually they can see what's happening in other parts of the system because they will be able to help individuals as well as be able to check off has it gone have they got the blood test and what's happening there so I think there's development to need to do but it's it's sort of it will the communication is key. I think that the information sharing is um, important for service users and carers, but I think it's even more so as the systems try and start working more um, integrated together. Yeah, I thought I'd come back on direct payments as, as Wendy's mentioned it. But, but before I do that, I think I think it's um, there's an interesting tension for us to manage overall between a strategy that's been really well consulted on, but it's not super broad in what it's focusing on in relation to diagnosis and post-diagnostic support whereas the feedback from Wendy in particular has been about living well with dementia not dissimilar to what maybe our deaf community would want to not be stigmatized to be able to live a life that with opportunities alongside other people around housing getting out and about not feeling like it's about a medicalized process kind of being alive so I think that's an interesting tension for us to talk about. It's about well-being when you get down to it. In terms of direct payments, Wendy's part of the um, Making It Real board and adult social care, so 50% people with lived experience, Wendy, one of those. Wendy's been bending our ear for a while on how slow we've been to get moving on reforming our direct payments work. And I think what's really going to help me, though, it's a bit embarrassing, actually. I didn't know about Wendy's individual situation so I'll probably have a quick chat with Wendy later and just see how we can use that to get a bit of leverage around some very practical things that we could do quickly. There are some complicated things around direct payments that might take a while to do, but everyone in this room will feel like it's in, un, unjust if someone's having to change a, a long-term working relationship with somebody for the, for the sake of a few pence. So I'll, I'll take that on board and pick that up with Wendy. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Richard and then Anthony. Yeah, thank you very much um, for this morning's presentation and for the um, individual input. There are a couple of things I would pick up. The first one was the one about what the nurse said to you, Wendy. Um, I, I suspect that could be my organisation, but irrespective of whether it is my organisation, I would say that every organisation in this room would not accept that as a comment from a member of staff. Um, and we would absolutely want to know that because that's a totally inappropriate response to to the circumstances and um, that you found yourself in so if I know that that does occur and you have information from yourself or colleagues then we'd like to know because we want to deal with those sorts of issues as uh, as they happen in respect to training I think 
we all try to provide appropriate and adequate training and I'm not aware of any circumstances where we'd allow colleagues to enter into clinical settings without any training so they all have training the question is are we getting the training right for different circumstances and so what we have to do with these lived experiences is try to adapt and use them to tailor the training to meet people's needs because we do review training every year just to make sure that um, we're trying as much as possible to cover off um, the, the areas where that training will have the greatest impact. And what I would say about TESS, because um, many people won't know in the audience, but I actually chair the, um, the South Yorkshire Pathology Programme, which deals with testing across South Yorkshire you know, in most of its guises. And we also have um, a similar setup for radiology is that all tests have a turnaround time. And therefore, again, I agree with Neil, it's about communication because blood tests, we expect the results back from the labs within a time frame. CT, MRI, x-rays, imaging. And so I think what we've got to do with patients is give them an expectation of when the test will be available. And if it isn't available, to follow it up because we know roughly when it's going to come back within a, within a day or two, usually. And if it isn't back within that time, then there's a reason. And the reason could be that the test has been mislaid, the request card, the report might have not been sent. But again, what I think we've got to do is communicate better on those sorts of things. Because patient power and following up on those sorts of things is one of the things that actually makes sure it gets done. And so from a practical point of view, again, I think we've got to communicate better on expectations. Thank you, Richard. And then... Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Phil. Nice to see you both. Um, I'm really positive about this, about the strategy and, and, and about the new provider as well, picking up on those things we just got to, 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 to iron out. Um, I was trying to link it back to Councillor Smith's um, um, comment on, uh, earlier on in the meeting about engagement and user engagement. Agree with Richard there about using it practically for how we can adapt, adapt our training. But overall, I'd hope you agree. I think we have a good approach in Doncaster to engaging with our engaging with our users, to um, consulting, to really really involving people. And I think really it's a learning we can take from this to to to, to other bits of work that we can do. So I think that was my point really. I think we need to take some of the good practice through through this into into mainstreaming in our approach. Okay, I'm going to sum up in a minute, but I'm just interested to know what training we do collectively and how people like Wendy, not just Wendy and Phil, but others are involved in providing that training and awareness, because I'm not sure from reading the strategy how that happens now. Um, I can't say across the board, um, unfortunately, and that's probably part of it. I think we know that um, our NHS providers provide a level of, a level of dementia awareness, um, and I think... Um, I think it's probably done individually rather than that same message across. I think that's something we can definitely look at. I think people who are um, you, more in contact with people with dementia, so people who are in them services sort of do dementia um, level one training and our care homes equally do um, dementia level one and level two training. But I do think there's probably um, looking at a more consistent approach about how we do that. Um, we're doing something very similar around end of life um, training and how we're doing some of um, what that looks like. And I think we can mirror some of that and making sure we've got a bit of a standard approach. There is a sort of national definitions around uh, those levels of training, but I think with, there's something we can be doing um, on the back of this train, um, this strategy around how we do that more collectively as a, as a borough, as a city. Okay, so what I'm going to plan to do now for Wendy and Phil's benefit is just sum up some actions because this is what we do at the meeting and I want you to tell me if I've missed anything. Is that okay? So I think one of the things that Nabil said, or sorry, it might have been Richard, in terms of communicating with patients, so when they do have a blood test or any other test, what they need to expect. And then as you use the word phrase, Richard, patient power, um, I don't know how we can do that, but I would like the NHS colleagues to look at how we can take that action. Because if you know your blood test is due in a week and it hasn't come back, then not putting the emphasis on you, Phil, but then residents know that they are quite entitled. You know, my mum's, like, unfortunately, like a lot of 87-year-olds, doesn't want to pester the GP, but we want to get across that you, if you're expecting a result, then you ring up and find out when it's coming back, and if it's not back, ask why. I'm getting nods from NHS colleagues, so we're not asking too much. 
The other, we need desperate reassurance in terms of Wendy's service that that's going to happen. And I think I, as a chair, would like that reassurance that there's not going to be, Wendy, any problems with the new service starting. Um, because it's worrying that you don't know about that already, but I'm assured that Joe's going to pick that up straight away after this. I had had reassurance um, right, that those letters had gone out, so apologies that I'll be making sure that one's not, not gone to Wendy's own, but has gone to everybody else, or actually hasn't, but I'll pick that up and I will um, contact Wendy and I'll let you know, Rachel. Thank oh, you. Sorry, Councillor Blake. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Rachel's fine. I don't know why we went to Councillor Blake, but anyway. Um, the other one is around that dementia awareness, and I think as a board would really like to see some system health and care and joint approach. Is that or, or some collective reassurance that we know that everybody's had that training, but also that Wendy, Phil and others are involved in shaping that? Um, or actually, because we've all learned as a health and wellbeing board that nothing works more than actually hearing directly from people. Phil, do you want to come back on? Yeah, it's quite a long discussion we could have about this stuff, because some, some of it's just about being person-centred and sensitive when we listen to people regardless of and I think that's sometimes a problem is we, we we put people in boxes want to be trained about the medical condition around that box but but our empathy's kind of gone somewhere so I think there's a there's a little bit of a challenge around 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 that but I completely when there needs to be something in place um, and I, I suppose what I was thinking is we do now have a workforce leave for Doncaster there was some work recently presented to the place committee about priorities. Um, I'm assuming that, that this sort of discussion will be within scope for them and, and, and what they're managing. So just a suggestion that we might play it in that direction. Yeah, it sounds good. We'll take that as an action in terms of the workforce lead. Anthony, is that yeah. OK? Lovely. Um, then in terms of feedback i think that was another point that richard made that if people you know when does the, the comment that was made was totally inappropriate and i think we need as a system to really encourage people to give that feedback because then it can be investigated so that's another action um i think i've covered most things but wendy and phil because how this works is that in say six months time we need to revisit as a board to make sure that this strategy is working because it's amazing the work that's been done and we really welcome the fact that so many people responded that you've been involved. But obviously it's a strategy on paper and we'll only be satisfied when you perhaps come back in six months and tell us that the changes that you are expecting through the strategy have actually been made. So out of those actions, is there any... Oh, sorry, direct payments is the other one, Wendy, that Phil's going to pick up. Is there anything else I've missed that you want us as health, social care, voluntary sector to do? Um, just work together, get on the same page and um, just make it like so we can live, that's all we want to do, live better. And and we're not asking for the world, just make things easy as, 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 as illness progresses. And, and just take us at face value. That's all I'm asking. Just all get on the same page and everybody will get on. Is that okay? Perfect. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Phil, anything you want to add? Well, there is just one thing. Uh, if you do happen to uh, have to be go to a home, it's the cost of the home. Now, as I say, my, my brother-in-law, he will end up in the one in Mexbury. He's already got a place. But I'm told it's about £900 a week. A friend of mine at uh, my golf club, I was talking to him today, and he was applying to go in home, and he says there's nothing really less than a £1,000 a week, you know, which is a massive amount of money. And, you know, it doesn't take long to get rid of your house that, that way. I don't know what happens then, but uh, it just seems, you know, massive amount of money to pay. Thank you, Phil. I think that's not so much a local issue, but I'm very aware that um, the government have looked at um, in terms of strategies, I lose track of, of what where they are at the moment, but that's certainly something that we can um, take up as a health and wellbeing board um, and as chair and actually uh, write to the government to see where they are with that at the moment in terms of payment and fees for care homes. 
Could I just uh, mention something else about the notification back to us after you've had a test, no matter what you're, whether you've got any illness at all. But the addition at my own uh, GP is, is that, well, if you don't hear from us, you're all right. And that's it, you know. <laughs> that's not reporting back to you. And you ring up and then the, the receptionist has got the job of trawling through your records and said, all right, all right, it's all right. It doesn't say anything about your area. And that could be weeks away. So there's, we've never had anybody calling us up at our house, no matter what it's been for, to say, oh, well, you're all okay there. There's nothing to worry about. Okay, I think it was more Nabil was thinking in terms of if you've not heard anything back, then to contact your practice. Is that what it was, Nabil? Yeah, um, I think just the sheer volume, uh, you'd probably be astounded at the number of blood test results we get um, receive on a, on, a, on a daily basis. And even if we had one of our um, reception, non-clinical staff ringing everyone uh, with a blood test result, that would be them not able to take any call and probably clog up all our phone lines. I think that there is a definite point about actually, it's that prioritisation and that um, instruction given when we request the blood test. So, so what I will tell someone, I almost, sorry, I'll be quick, segment it into three ways. There are ones that I definitely want to follow up with the person regardless of the result. So I'll arrange a follow-up appointment when I'm requesting the test, because I know I want to see or speak to you either way. There are some who um, uh, I will only want to follow up if the, if the result shows something, and I'll say, can you, know, you know, either you ring up or um, you know, find out, you know, or we, we'll call you in the, with the result in a, in a few weeks, or call back if you haven't heard within X. And there are some who is generally doing it for more reassurance, not expecting to find anything. And I'll say, if you don't hear anything, that means it's normal if you do want to check do that but I, I think I think you're right with the way we work and the volume and the complexity of things the key thing is when we're requesting the test and coming back to what Richard said as well when we're requesting the test when we make a referral the patient the family member the advocate needs to leave with what the plan is and that's probably what we're not doing effectively and a work in progress without an overnight fix unfortunately okay thank you hopefully that explains Phil uh yeah, sorry, my, I just wanted to come in about the general awareness. So I've been involved in the dementia work for a long time and I'm involved in the collaborative. Um, and we do produce a directory in my team that we review every year and it's online and there's a hard copies that we print off as well and people from the collaborative have found that really helpful. We also used to do dementia friends and it kind of got lost during COVID so that might be something else going forward we could look at. It was sort of a national initiative but we used to have people in Doncaster, it's kind of got lost. So it's just in terms of awareness raising and training and things like that. Okay. Just I'd add that in, Rachel. Thanks. Very much, Louise. Wendy? Uh, can I just say, I was a dementia champion and I did dementia sessions for people with dementia. So they got their badges just as well as everybody else. So if you're taking any sessions forward, I volunteer. Thank you very much, Brilliant. Wendy. And I think we've got lots of actions. I can't see anybody else coming in. Louise's point, I think, is a really good one. I would ask everybody in the room to look at the strategy and think how their organisation can contribute to what Phil and Wendy said in terms of living well with dementia, because that's we've got all got a responsibility to do that. In terms of coming back to the board, Louise, I'm thinking perhaps six months' time it would be useful to have a brief update. Yeah. Phil and Wendy, you're welcome to come back again and tell us how it's going and would really appreciate that. Um, I know coming to these boards is not easy, um, so I would really like to thank you both, not just for giving up your time, but sharing your experiences, which has really made a difference to us all. So thank you very much. You're very welcome to stay for the rest or please leave if you'd prefer to, but thank you. And we look forward to the ongoing conversation. Carrying on to the next item, which is that ongoing conversation. So Pauline, to remind us all, came to us in uh, March. Seems longer than that, uh, Pauline. And we took a number of actions. And Pauline is going to go through each of those actions and tell us about progress and also next steps. So over to you. Thank you. Bye. Well, I'm pleased to say I've met a lot of nice people. And this time, everything has been quite positive and listening to the BSL user. I would add that British Sign Language is not a foreign language. It is a disability language, and they have different needs. 
and talking with the box, you know, think out of the box for the BSL user. Um, all matters arising from pages 9 and 10 attached to the agenda are in good working progress and with follow-on meetings as well. I've met all the, everyone and been in conversation with um, Rihanna to have a meeting with her later. Um, Dr. Asindi, um, Ray Hennessy, and uh, Grace Mahara of the NHS. I've had meetings with them. Dr. Asindi came to the Deaf Centre. Grace Mahara came to the Deaf Centre. And um, Annika Leyland. Um, it was interesting because none of them really knew of the work the Deaf Society does for the health and well being of the BSL user in Doncaster. Roughly all together is about 1,200. 600 registered with sensory and 600 who don't wish to be registered. And at some point or other, they do come to the Deaf Society. Um, so but working on from that, everything has been actioned and we're looking into further wellbeing issues as well. Um, I would say that we met with Sally Chalk of Clarion Interpreter Services where DMBC have the contract because the BSL provision of interpreters is not really good. There is a national shortage of BSL interpreters but there is no trainee BSL interpreter in Doncaster and that does help when it comes to things that the Deaf Society need. They don't always need a qualified registered BSL interpreter to cover their needs, a trainee interpreter they can accept. Um, going back to um, where are we now? Grace and the NHS, those meetings have been good and I've had several teams meetings as well. Everything's been covered that we raised and more. One is communication so um, with hospital appointments. So we've been in touch um, with Grace, who is covering this, information on the back of letters from hospitals and appointments. She sent me a draft, and it was not suitable for a BSL user to understand in any way, and there was just a phone number again. So I've adapted that, sent it to Grace. She's working on that now. But I have suggested that the hospitals, and maybe even the council, look at Sign Live. And this is also an app that the BSL user downloads and they press that and that it's instant interpreting 24-7. But um, Sheffield have it, Nottinghamshire have it, Morecambe Bay, most hospitals now in the country have sign live. And that is good because we also have uh, people coming, deaf people, BSL, BSL, but sign language people from the Ukraine and Poland coming in and they use sign live and they can communicate that way as well. So that is, that is important to get sign live or even a text number. We have, there is an issue with the elderly because they are just not digitally savvy or nor do they have anything that they can use that with. Sensory team are very good, but sensory team have limitations because they cover all deafness. So there really isn't, um, you can't expect them to do the work that other organisations and service providers can do. We have teamed with uh, Citizens Advice because Century Team tend to refer our people to Citizens Advice, which is right, but Citizens Advice don't have the BSL experience. So going back to the Well Done Caster funding where the society received money for a, a community link worker, which is lacking, um, through all sort of events happening, uh, we teamed with Citizens Advice and they are going to um, advertise when we get the money. It's something to do with European funding and it's with Doncaster Council legal department now. It's not only us, it's four groups that this has affected. But when we do get that, and citizens' advice do get this BSL advisor, they will train them into the citizens' advice ad advisory role, but they will be BSL. So with that, 
the, the, that alleviates a lot of issues that we have. They can go there and they can see the BSL advisor signing, filling forms about everything that the citizens' advice cover. Because the citizens' advice have issues getting interpreters as well. So once we get that in post and working, a lot of issues will disappear and they will be set up with that. But we, we, it does require the funding and then we just got it. Well, we haven't got the funding yet, but it is just for a year. So hopefully after that, we can monitor that and just see how this BSL interpreter working with citizens advice can link in with Doncaster Council because they're based in the same area regard reception um, coming in and no one is BSL. Highlighting everything um, but have had discussions with everyone and we're moving on. I've been concerned that the gaps I thought we had are wider than I thought. And it's been surprising that how lack of information that service providers don't particularly understand the deaf BSL user and their needs. So we're hoping to do that as well. We're trying to get into the other community groups and community organisations, but again, it is there's a, just that barrier, that communication barrier that we have. So we're working on eliminating that through funding, but we do need to have funding, the society. Um, we're all volunteers, and apart from myself, I'm BSL, but they are all native BSL users. When you walk into the Deaf Community Centre, it's BSL and nothing else, which is quite unique and something to be proud of. But they do and still need this support, and as we're working through what we're working through with all the hospital departments, NHS departments, council departments as well. Hopefully we will, we will get there now. I just feel I'm speaking to the right people so we can get something done. Okay, thank you so much, Pauline, and, and thank you to everybody who has taken those actions forward and it's just really good to hear about the progress. I'll bring the veil in, but that sign live app sounds as though something that would be useful for Team Doncaster. I'm looking at Louise to see if we can look at yeah. how, we've, if we've not got that with our comms team, how we get that because that makes perfect sense. But I'll bring the beer in because I can see you want to... Yeah, uh, thanks Chair and um, thanks Pauline. Um, so, so yeah, a couple of things. So, um, uh, Pauline obviously alluded to it, there is a, um, a session planned for the 19th of September with a, a focus group of uh, BSL users and interpreter um, and then a few key people from the health services uh, broader just to go pick up some of these things in, in more detail, see what we've been able to do and then what we need to um, continue work on. It, it wasn't said but it should be said and noted is that um, what Pauline's told all of us is that We've had similar conversations a few years ago. People came and, and gathered all that information, took it away, and then things didn't change. So one of the commitments that myself, Ray, and, and, and others have given is that that can't happen again. You know, there's no, it's we, we're really disappointing if, if people have invested that time, particularly Pauline and, and, and the BSL users invest that time and it's the same discussion again. In, in a few years. So I think that's the kind of thing where we need holding to account um, on those actions. And then just the specific action that I had um, at, at the top of that list around um, uh, correcting a, a misconception about that the GP practice has to pay for the BSL interpreter. We did send that message out straight away, but um, in terms of the way that communications work, in terms of um, staff turnover as well, that is a message that will sort of need refreshing so I think we rely on, on Pauline and colleagues to tell us if actually there is improvement in that if it's still happening and then what it might be is if we can find out which practices or if it's across all practices then we do a bit more um, targeted communication but as you'll sort of picked up from the theme around the earlier conversation as well training and education is an iterative ongoing thing it's rarely you send one message out um, and that fixes everything. Okay, thank you very much, Nabil. Unless there's any other comments um, in terms of keeping us on track so we don't 
much yet lose the good progress that we've made. If you're happy and you've got time, Pauline, to work with Louise to decide if you want to come back to the perhaps the January meeting. Um, but I would emphasize that if you do have individual concerns, not just about GP practices, but council services or others that people at your center have um, experienced, then please use Louise to feed back on when we can feed that into the services because that current um, time specific problems can be easily addressed then. Yes, yeah, okay? de definitely. It is just working together and actioning everything. Okay, thank you ever so much, Pauline. Really appreciate giving up your time. And if nobody's, I, I've had the opportunity um, to come to the centre on a Friday evening, and uh, it is a fantastic experience to meet everybody. So um, thank you, Pauline. Yes, Chair, I just wanted to correct something that was said earlier. I did send you a, an email to that effect. Uh, I needed to clarify something about the fact that uh, there was no contact made uh, with health by Health Watch Doncaster. Um, our Chief Operating Officer has in fact indicated that she has made contact, but she was waiting for a response and they agreed to contact each other in September. Uh, the lady did say uh, that she hadn't had any contact and uh, I, I, I'm led to believe that there has been some contact. Uh, we are uh, very keen to establish continuing contact, particularly with such organisations as uh, the Deaf Society and uh, other such organisations. So we would like that to be continuing. So um, if, you know, if you want contact details of Fran again, then I'm quite happy to provide them. Or if you, you, know, you just want to have a, a general chat with me and we can pass that on and establish some sort of a link. But you know, they do a superb job and we would hate to, to lose that. Um, there have been some mistakes in the past and we can acknowledge that uh, from both sides, but we, we, will, we will and hope to move forward on that. Okay, I don't, thanks for acknowledging the mistakes. I think that's down to, you know, we wouldn't want to think Pauline had made mistakes. So, no. uh, may, may I just clarify? I didn't say no contact. I said I, they had not contacted us after COVID, nothing okay. at all. And I actually contacted Healthwatch to find out what was happening. Okay. Thank you, Pauline, and thank okay, you, Andrew, thank for you. the clarification. But thank you again, Pauline, and we'll look forward to seeing you perhaps in January. Not January. It would be sort of March time. Because okay. we, we do need more time to do what we're actually working towards. Fully understand. Thank, thank you, you ever so much, Pauline, for giving up your thank time. You. Um, okay, so we're all asked to keep on track of those actions which would uh, enable us to meet the needs of the BSL community more effectively than we have done up to now. Okay, um, we've agreed further actions, which is good. So on to item eight now, which is the update on children, young people's mental health and wellbeing strategy. So we have Emma and Martin, who have been here a number of times. Um, so I think it was a short presentation and then obviously I believe we're being shown a video which is from the young advisors who were talking about the work that's been done. So thank you very much. Is it you starting, Emma? Thank you. It is. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as you're probably all aware, this presentation commences year two of our three-year project that we're ha happening with children, young people's mental health and well-being. We're really grateful of the opportunity to present this to the Health and Wellbeing Board today and the progress that we've made through year one. Um, today allows us to reflect really and reset on our priorities for year two. And as Chair, you've just mentioned, we do have the opportunity from our young advisors to discuss um, their thoughts and views on what's happened over the last 12 months, but also going forward as to what they could see as our ambitions for the next 18 months to two years. Now, while some of our young advisors have unfortunately left us to join university, we welcomed Tash and um, Charlotte into the group probably about six months ago. They've been working really closely with us on the mental health strategy and have been attending our meetings, helping us to shape exactly what the focus needs to be for the next two years, and also ensuring that our commission intentions are right and doing that test and challenge of our commission intentions going forward. So pleased to introduce them to you on video. Uh, they're going to, as I said, just discuss about how they feel it's going and what we can do over the next two years of the strategy. Hi. Hi. My name's Tash. My name is Charlotte, and we're your advisors for Doncaster Council. 
This is our feedback and suggestions after reading the Children and Young People's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy Review. I've met us at the Year 1 Review of the Strategy. Our role is to provide feedback and suggestions on the progress and ambition of the strategy to ensure young people are being listened to and represented. We are going to go through the nine wellbeing points and talk about progress still to be made, then reflect on the strategy priorities. Wellbeing hubs could be incorporated into schools, community centres, libraries, youth hubs and other family hubs. PSHG lessons or external providers could help children and young people identify their emotions and articulate how they feel. Schools can teach healthy coping mechanisms for normal negative emotions. The Sully Hall approach and parenting courses need promoting and recommending more. We would suggest this by posters and videos. We would also like to review the training on this site. Zone 5 to 19's children and parent groups should be publicised more. We think it would be helpful for a physical leaflet to be made available to parents to help them understand children and young people's mental health. Training should be available for school staff to understand and support children's mental health and well-being. Staff attitudes must be appropriate and staff should be approachable so students feel safe to come with them with any problems. Staff should know how to identify mental health conditions and neurodevelopmental conditions so support can be given to students without them having to explicitly reach out themselves. Young people can be invited to share their experiences with council members at meetings and scrutinies. Schools and social workers should listen to young people more about how they want mental health to be approached. Communication between young people and services should be easier and more accessible. Schools could talk to students about self-care through mindfulness and well-being activities. The council or young advisors could create a poster of how you could care for yourself. Children and young people could be encouraged in schools to create a healthy routine that prioritises their mental health and well-being. More surveys for all young people in Doncaster could be done so that we have an up-to-date overview of the current big picture in Doncaster. We think that the board should also include young advisors from the Children in Care Forum group as well as other young people's groups. We also think that forum groups should be made to be as representative and diverse as possible. We think that Your Life Doncaster should be promoted more, which we think could be done through a targeted YouTube or TikTok advert. It has improved, but it still needs to be more young person friendly. We are currently developing a young person's platform with Doncaster Council Comms, and this is going very well so far. There could be more promotion of mental health support teams, as not all children and young people, as well as parents and carers, are aware of this in schools. Promotion, promotion could include posters or perhaps emails to parents and carers at the start of every academic year. It is also important that children who are out of education do not go off the radar to avoid personal neglect of needs, including their mental health well-being. We think that more health education is needed in Doncaster and that healthy diets and choices should be promoted more. Referrals for mental health conditions and neurodevelopmental conditions should be easier and quicker, particularly for post-16 students. We think that Doncaster Council should use statistics to provide targeted support to different groups. We also wonder how many staff members who are working with children and young people have training in mental health and wellbeing. When making this video, we did some youth voice. A third of the young people we surveyed disagreed with the statement that they are supported enough with their mental health and well-being in Doncaster, and most of the young people surveyed didn't think that parents, carers, school staff or professionals were competent in supporting young people with their well-being. That's the end if you want to go back to the slides, thank you. So just while that's loading, you may remember that the young advisors have been central to the wellbeing ambitions that set through the middle of our strategy. And what the young advisors have there tried to do is, on the back of those ambitions, give an update on where they think there could be improvements for the next 12 months to 18 months, but also comment on some of the work that they're undertaking as part of the strategy as well. I'll move it forward here. Yeah, thank you. 
So just to summarise some of our year one successes, and a massive thank you to Tash and Charlotte for being part of the reset of these priorities going forward. There's changes that we've updated previously on early intervention platform and rolling out training to schools. These deliverables have been real, really crucial to un underpinning the um, service implementation that we've seen over the last 12 months. We've kept our focus groups really small and targeted to ensure we've not had any deviation from the groups and have had that test and challenge with our young advisors during the mental health strategy sessions that we've held. Our outcomes from year one, we try to keep as clear as possible and some of the ones such as the implementation of the digital mental health tool was really in ensured that we had our clear sight on what we needed to implement and we could roll it out as quickly as possible. There is work underway at crossing our strategy into the other strategies in the local authority, such as Early Help and Send. I know that Callum's here today presenting a little later on some of those cross-strategy priorities that we're working on continuously. School holidays has had a big impact on some of our provision over the last 12 months, and it is a consideration that we're going to be looking at for the next year's worth of delivery and ensuring that we get the best out of the time that our pupils are within the school and we can liaise with our um, governors and with our school teachers on the work that we're trying to uh, impl imply in Doncaster. You should see later on as well that we have learned from some system changes and there is a direct correlation into the governance and oversight and changes that we're going to be making going forward. So into the next year we have refreshed our priorities um, and you will see that following the pupil lifestyle survey and targeted surveys we've done across Doncaster as well as working with our young advisors we've identified that really the overall aim of our strategy going forward is to address the inequities across the system through two main priorities. The first priority will be to deliver a system-wide in early intervention and a whole family approach to support for mental health that really builds the resilience of children and young people and supporting young people and their families to get the best out of their situations. And the second priority is to deliver mental health support that provides equitable access and outcomes for everybody at place and ensuring that children and young people are at the centre of what we're wanting to provide for them and their families going forward. There's a really a clear focus on the whole family approach and getting it right at the, at the right time. And these priorities are really deliberately wide scoped so that we can ensure that we're flexible to all relevant partners and priorities that's going forward. We really want to ensure that as we did in year one, these priorities mean something to everybody. So when we've spoken to our partners across Doncaster, it's ensuring that they can make the most out of these priorities that we're setting for year two. So whilst noting that the, the new priorities really sharpen um, that focus on accessibility uh, and integration of services, we also are continuing with the work that we've established very successfully during year one. And a lot of that work, uh, I think, has already been mentioned by the, the young advisors in, in their input. But, but in summary, um, first of all, in terms of accessing services, we've seen a real impact from our online platform, which has led to, um, I think, sort of well over so 2,000 registrations from our, our young people, uh, 13,000 logins uh, on, the, on the Couth system. Um, but also we are still working with our young advisors on delivering the, the well-being hubs and making sure that we can find the right locales to be able to, to offer those physical uh, areas of support. So, so that work is ongoing. In terms of the work with, with our schools, we, we, we're really pleased that we have managed to do direct training around sort of well-being and trauma-informed practice with 72 of our schools. Um, and additional to that, um, with 1,600 professionals working in the education system uh, through 93 training sessions, which have targeted that early intervention point within those, within those services. But noting, as already been noted in this meeting, really, the training is iterative and it takes time and we have to keep working on that that remains a priority for us alongside our work in terms of mapping out the offer from our school sector and making sure that we uh, can identify gaps on a, on a local level so we we have also tried to make sure that what we're doing is we're focusing the strategy as emma said on voice all the way through and we've widened that work uh, in terms of the making sure that we are, are going into the sort of corners of people's experience. So working with our, our youngsters with special needs and disabilities through the shadow board, widening some of the engagements that we are, are doing, which are represented back onto the, the strategic group. 
So, so within um, the the slide, you'll be able to see how the nine ambitions that our young advisors have have set us within the priority, how those things are are being demonstrated in our ongoing work. So, whilst the strategy is um, presenting a relatively new focus on two new priorities, well, we wanted to make sure that um, the strategic group also is monitoring the impact of those pieces of work as well. So just in terms of the um, priorities that what we have developed working with young advisors and professionals from right across the system, just in summary really, one, accessibility of information. So we are, are working on ensuring that we have really strong platforms that are really clear, that are very workable for young people and families to be able to access services. That work is ongoing. I know that um, we we're currently consulting on some aspects of it, but that remains one of those priorities that young people are really clear we need to, we need to maintain. Um, in, in terms of making sure that we are addressing inequalities, there are a couple of pieces of work within the priorities around how we make sure that we have got a, a broader and more specific offer for um, working with uh, areas of the community who are struggling to access uh, services. Um, but also then there's a focus around, uh, around assessment and First of all, developing a, a single system-wide early health mental health assessment, uh, but also then looking at how we can have integrated assessments uh, at the uh, as um, children and young people progress uh, down the continuum. So this. The second priority, if I get to that, the second priority um, is very much then focused around um, access and voice, and we are, are looking at introducing these things. Firstly, making sure that we have a real focus on uh, early years and ensuring that there is an integrated offer at that point, and I know that Callum's going to be speaking uh, a little bit about this uh, in a later item on this agenda. Um, but also, there's a, a real question that our young advisors have asked us about our oversight and control and use of data, um, where we know that there needs to be a, a more comprehensive and strategic use of data from right across the spectrum of need and pathways. Um, and so that becomes a priority, as does, as I've mentioned earlier on, the need to make sure that we are understanding and mapping out what our universal services are offering and where there are gaps in localities, particularly um, from understanding what is happening on a, on a school level where we know so much of the uh, initial contact is, is made for our, our children and young people. So, so those are the, in summary, I suppose, the, 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 the major items. Um, but what we, what we want to be able to do is also sort of develop um, pilots and uh, our opportunities to look at really specific issues around children and young people accessing services in individual communities and trying to get under the, under the surface through our work with uh, interest groups of how to, we can make sure that we're addressing some of the specifics in relation to, to that. As a, a strategic group, we have looked also at refining and connecting uh, our governance. So whilst we, we maintain uh, our updates to uh, the board here, um, we've also tried to slim down our implementation model so that there is just a really clear uh, uh, focus on the impact of the work of each of the delivery groups for our priorities, um, but also uh, making sure that we have a clear line across to our work in education and skills. We, we want this and the voice of our children and young people to have quite an impact on what changes are being planned within the education sector and so we've strengthened the uh, link across um, to make sure that the voice that you've heard in this meeting is then influencing broader strategy within the education sphere and already through the education and skills um, work we can see that um, we will be um, introducing as a partnership an inclusion charter and a relational um, kite mark for work in schools to be able to develop um, that practice that was described by our young advisors to make sure that we are ensuring that our workforce 
are highly skilled in terms of their sensitivity in dealing with uh, young people's uh, emotions from, from the earliest point. So that work and some of the other work, um, including the work that's going on through our special needs and disability strategy, which picks up a lot of those threads, for example, reshaping the, the, the way that our uh, neurodevelopmental pathways operate um, and looking at how we make sure that schools are doing early intervention to fund emotional needs, um, to, to, to deliver responses to emotional needs from the earliest point. That work is going on in those areas as well, which will feed back into the work of the uh, strategic group. So we we are, would like board to to sort of note, I suppose, the the sort of shift in emphasis, the the response to the voice from our, our children and young people, um, and also to um, welcome kind of sort of further input and questions from colleagues today and beyond this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, looking for comments. Okay, so I've got Mike, then Phil. Oh, hold on, I've got quite a few. So, Mike, Phil, Andrew, Nabil, and Victor. Okay, starting with Mike. Thank you. Oh, and Pauline. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just um, in terms of the particular groups you were talking about interacting with, there's a couple of BCF schemes in particular that spring to mind. Um, so, the Vulnerable Adolescent Scheme, which is about you know stopping young people uh, entering the care system, which you're probably aware of. Um, um, and obviously, care, you know, care leavers, uh, big prevalence there between homelessness and, and employment um, and other issues. Um, and, and, and also the parenting support service. So that's uh, a scheme funded in-house local authority that um, is there predominantly to support with bereavement support, but any I suppose, suppose support issues below the CAMS threshold. So they, they might be willing groups to, to engage with. Thank Thanks. You. I'll move on because that's just a comment to know. And next we've got Phil. Yeah, the Young Advisors video was really powerful. Um, just wondering, are you asking the Health and Wellbeing Board to endorse all of their recommendations? And are you going to make sure that all of their recommendations are visible and tracked in, in your actions? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And and again, we are only giving you a flavour, I suppose, of the way that our voice interacts with our strategic group. So it, it isn't just the film that we use there. We have our, our young people taking and measuring the impact of the work against the nine ambitions that they've set up. So so the answer is, yeah, absolutely. That is, that is our primary focus. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's more on a personal note than... Uh, from Health Watch, but it obviously includes Health Watch as well. Um, uh, I've been involved through the, uh, the care service uh, for around about 13 years now, um, mainly through fostering panels and uh, looked after children. I didn't see an awful lot of reference to looked after children, children, uh, and this is actually after all a children and young people strategy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and how is that being integrated into it? Because they obviously have. Um, uh, an awful lot of uh, mental health needs and things like that. Um, I'm glad that uh, access to things such as um, special educational needs and disabilities is being mentioned, but um, access to certain pathways is extremely difficult. Uh, when you look at, for example, uh, getting an assessment for autism, that can take years when the child is obviously uh, part of the this process, I was wanting to know how uh, it would be uh, integrated into this in a, in a more positive way. Uh, and generally as well, CAMS, which is another system as mentioned, and uh, again, the, the waiting list for access to this is, is often an extremely long pathway into it in the first place. Uh, broadly speaking though, I do welcome this. I think it's a very good strategy going forward. Uh, and I don't know whether or not it's, it's appropriate, but I just wondered whether or not, if we're looking at looked after children, is the corporate parenting board involved in all of this as well? Okay, if we can come back at that, I'm going to take the other two questions, so if you could note them out, Martin, please, first. So I've got Nabil next. Yeah, uh, mine was just a quick uh, question, Martin. You mentioned about sort of the training um, side of things. Do you do any um, follow-up with the staff um, to ask them afterwards, you know, do they feel confident after the training do you go back and, and I guess it's that side of things. Thanks Nabil and lastly Victor. 
Thank you, Martin and Emma. Um, just three points I wanted to touch on. Uh, and, and overall, I think um, very good overview of the whole strategy. Uh, I've noticed also some very good linkage with uh, healthy eating, for example, which is a key aspect and it's, and it's really welcome. Um, the, the voice of the young people is a very important one. I was kind of interested in how diverse that view is uh, among the various population characteristics. Um, uh, we got mentioned about looked at children, maybe people who are new to the system, they're like they're less likely to speak out, but would be experiencing a lot of uh, hidden uh, mental health issue. People from BME background, for example, um, how how those voices are captured and perhaps embedded as part of ongoing uh, mechanism of continuing to engage with um, with 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 the service. And then the last, the third point is uh, about the data. Uh, we know there are data available that we routinely collect. Uh, how do we systematically use that? Again, uh, that can tell us a story about some of the different characteristics within it, rather than only global. Thank you. And last question from Pauline, and then we'll come to the answer. I'll make a start and I think Emma will pick up from that point. Just just, just really quickly on this point, I know it's not strictly a mental health point, but I, I think that, that point's very well made about deaf children. I think the uh, pandemic highlighted the risks of isolation in terms of language, uh, and I am well aware that there is a piece of work that's being developed from within the children and family services looking at how we can move to a model where we are having much more universal impact uh, around uh, BSL and around deaf awareness in general. Uh, and I think that is quite critical to ensuring the, the well-being of, of youngsters in that, in that community. So I do think that's important to welcome the comment. Um, just, just in terms of um, representation and voice, I think both points are, are really well made and the young advisors' points are really well made about how do we make sure that we have a flow of voice that comes in and out of those strategic priorities and also holds us to account. Uh, and uh, as you'll see, uh, the young advisors have articulated really clearly about the role of, of care leavers and the Children and Care Council in terms of m making sure we do that. We will be inviting them to to uh, shape what their contribution looks like. But I think there is a much more challenging point beyond that, which, it, which is around getting into the corners of those different areas of experience in terms of the depth and intensity of, of young people's experience with uh, from different groups. And I, I think that is a challenge, which obviously we've got on our priorities, um, but I think is something that we, we really need to, to focus on. So that will be something that we update in future updates on, is just looking at how what impact that has had and how we've tackled that 
issue, which was an issue that I think we were aware of, that whilst you've made a lot of progress in a lot of universal areas, those specifics remain challenging. And I think that goes for data as well. I, I think we, we have raised that as an issue, that there hasn't been routine collection and sharing of that data across agencies, and there's been some fragmentation in that regard. So that is something that obviously we've put on our priorities. We will take away. We will be accountable to the board on. Um, as regards follow-ups to training, I think, um, to be honest, Nabil, I think it is variable. I think there'll be some areas of the training where we, we know we can demonstrate that there have been impact from our practitioners. But I think in terms of a kind of system-wide, workforce-wide uh, ability to be able to say, well, actually, what difference has it made? I don't think we, we, can, we can really give you that um, evidence. But once more, as we go into the next round of work with the, with the wider workforce, and particularly those practitioners in schools, noting the great difference of starting points and cultures in our, um, our very kind of variable system, if you like, um, that we can now attach that to our priorities in terms of making sure that we start to report back on practitioner confidence as an outcome of um, those inputs. And I'll just add a couple of points. So with regards to the CAMS waiting list and the waiting times, we have seen since COVID the waiting list starting to reduce. So for our CAMS eating disorder services, whilst they were peaking in the pandemic at 12 week wait for routine, we're now well within the four week wait, which is the national target. It's currently sitting at one week and three days to see a practitioner, which is fantastic for Doncaster, one of the best in South Yorkshire. We've also got the mental health support teams that sit across 49% of our schools. And I'm really pleased to say I've had an email this morning to say they nationally will be rolling out um, MHST wave 11 and 12, which we will be bidding for for Doncaster to improve that so that we get equity for our children across Doncaster and for the schools that don't have that provision. And just finally, regarding the neurodiversity pathway, we are launching from the 1st of September a change to the neurodiversity pathway, which will see our providers, which is RDASH and DBTH, come together to redesign the pathway to go live for a start date of September 2024. That will see a change from a clinical model in-house within the trust to be a much more community integrated model into the localities that we see across Doncaster replicating the council model, but also being able to shape that around the family and around the school so that practitioners can be on, on hand in the community should they need any follow-up. Okay, right, I'm going to sum up because we're running short of time as we always have. So thank you very much for that and, and do pass on our, on our thanks to the young advisors. I think a couple of things have come out of those questions is that in terms of priorities, looked after children have got to be the priority in terms of population. I was at the, 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 the Hear Me Out group last night and their, their views on mental health you need to hear because they, we are not providing the service that they need. So I would really urge you, and as a board, I think we'd all agree, that has to be a priority in terms of that support um, for all, a whole host of reasons, but also in terms of prevention. What I'd really like to see in the strategy going forward, because I think this board is all about lived experience, and, and I'm looking at my fellow councillors now, but if I went out to most residents and parents and said, we had an update on the mental health strategy and good progress has been made, they would challenge me on that assumption. I'm getting nods. So what I'm really keen to see in future strategies is, is some qualitative and it is more like that quantitative data about how long people are having to wait for assessments, what that lived experience is, and I'm not saying the young advisors don't give that, but really those young people who are in services, or as we often find as counsellors, not in services for a number of years, and the impact that that has, not just on the immediate family, but the wider family, and how that can lead to incredible family breakdown um, because they aren't getting the support and services. Um, so I think it'd be really good if we could come back to this in say six months, nine months, to see what the, the update has been but to really understand how we're reducing those wasting times, how we're reducing that access, how well that school support is working. Because again, we hear anecdotally that it might be there, but it might not be the services that people actually want. Does that sound okay? Anything anybody think I've missed? Nigel? No, I mean, just to add to that, uh, Rachel, I think uh, uh, the, the key is, I mean, looking at the priorities, I think they're all right in terms of priority one and priority two. I mean. 
to me the key to this is is the access and the the information advice and guidance that the young person is going to get or the family is going to get when they they first hit that right okay i want to know what services are available there's a gap however between the offer and the initial aag and and that i'm, I'm not saying it's a concern because I, clearly you've got to develop that offer and you've got to obviously make sure it's an holistic offer that, that it, it contains other services but but to me the key to this is the iag first and foremost that that I can say, well, you know, um, Robbie in, in, in Bentley or, or somebody else who lives in sort of like Asken or, or over at Thorne knows exactly what to do if they feel that they're in crisis and that they need to contact somebody and on what route way that they can take. At this moment, I don't, I don't feel that. I'm, I'm, I, I admit I'm disconnected from it to a large degree, but, but it'd be good to see that in action and see it working that it's almost like, there you go, that's the route way I need to take and then obviously the, the offer comes further down the line, I get that. Is that okay? Okay then, thank you. I will close it there. So thank you very much for the update and we look forward to you working with Louise to see when you're going to come back and present that information. But please, I would ask you to go to the group as soon as possible via Tracy to make sure that happens. Okay. Thank you ever so much. Right, we're now going to move on to item nine, which is Family Hubs and Start for Life programme. Welcome, Callum. We all have had the presentation, Callum, so what I would urge you to do is to um, not just go through the presentation, but what do you want from us as system leaders in terms of health and social care? Um, so over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so... The purpose of this bringing, bringing this to you is to make you aware of the work that Family Hubs do in Doncaster and in particular the National Family Hub and Start for Life programme that Doncaster is a part of. The funding that we've uh, been allocated and how we have um, invested it in the local system and then just get your thoughts on that and how uh, if there's anything else we can, we can do. So just as a, a start-up of 10, in, in case any are unfamiliar with the family hubs and the family hub model, um, Doncaster has 12 family hubs uh, across the borough, um, three in each locality. Um, they are focused on providing place-based early intervention and prevention across an all-age offer. There is a very strong 0 to 5 offer um, and a, a lot of the reputation of family hubs comes from that 0 to 5 offer but it is important to note that it is an all age offer. So for example, um, I've listed some services there that are sort of beyond that nought to five age range. There's counseling provided through family hubs. There's employment and adult learning support for parents through family hubs. The young carers services run through it. And then there's parenting support and that sort of material support that families can need, particularly in current times. And the, the family hubs themselves sit at the center of our ambition for how we see ourselves delivering services to families and children, young people, um, and have been since their sort of christening in, in 2017. And just to give you a flavor of how successful they are, um, the graph on the right just gives an indication of how many contacts we have with families. So just from uh, April to June this year we had just over 37 and a half thousand contacts with families actual physical footfall in our 12 buildings and again just to give you a flavor the top three drivers of those footfalls are midwifery appointments their baby and toddler groups and they are youth groups so again there is an all-age element to um, the popularity of our hubs so the focus for them at the minute is the um, National Family Hub and Start for Life program. Without going too far into it, it's a manifesto commitment um, that was built on two foundational policies. One of them is the Healthy Child program, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with here. And the other one is the work that was commissioned through an all-party parliamentary group chaired by Dame Andrea Ledsom, which focused on a vision for the 1001 critical days. The long and short of it is the programme has two objectives. It's to join up and enhance services um, through family hubs so that parents and carers can access the support they need. And then there's also the fact that parents and carers should, be, should feel supported and empowered in caring for and nurturing their babies and children. 
So as I mentioned, Doncaster is one of the 75 local authorities that um, was allocated funding for this. And locally, it is very closely aligned to our goals for the Family Hub model. And in fact, because of how well embedded our Family Hub model is, our area was one of the sort of test cases for the sorts of things that the uh, model should deliver. And our model is reflected heavily in the frameworks that I will mention shortly, which is a testament to all the work that um, my predecessors did. So the programme is split into 26 strands. Six of them are funded, 20 of them are not funded. All of them have a series of minimum expectations and go furthers. I won't go into those, but you can find them online and read through them if you would like. It is down to us as a partnership to make sure that we are continuously moving the needle on all of these strands towards the go further expectations. As I say, because we had a strong foundation, we met a lot of the minimum levels anyway. So our focus for the life of this program is to move towards some of those go further expectations. <clears throat> Again, as you can see through the variety of the strands, it truly is an all age offer. So we've got things like naught to five activities and birth registration, but obviously there's also touching on things like mental health services, nutrition and weight management, SCND, um, substance misuse, youth justice, that there is expectations across the age spectrum for the family hub model. If I just take a second to focus on the funded strands, they are focused on the naught to five and in particular the naught to two elements of the family hub model. So the parenting support strand does what it says on the tin. It's focused on the universal and targeted parenting support that families can access through family hubs. Similarly, the infant feeding strand, straightforward, it is focused on how we promote positive feeding and weaning. And there's a focus on breastfeeding, but also an acknowledgement that formula feeding exists and that families who are unable to breastfeed will need support as well, which is a shift in policy of recent times. Parenting from relationships and perinatal mental health. This is focused on attachment and bonding and also on the parental mental health during the first two years. The home learning environment is focused on three to four year olds and it's basically a, an evolution of a similar government program that's been added into this which was a response to the pandemic and that speech and language need that came from the isolation of the lockdowns. So our Talking Together offer sits within that. Then there's the parent and carer panels. That's the voice element of it. We've been tasked with setting up a parent and carer panel, which we have done, and we need to publish a formal Start for Life offer. And then the Family Hub strand Family Hub Transformation Strand is your enablers, it's your things like data, communications, building improvements and those sorts of things. There we go. So the funding itself across the two and a half years is about 3.8 million. And as you can see from the general percentages up on screen, that is the level of focus that they've expected us to invest in within each strand. As you can see, beyond the enabling strand, the real focus is parent infant relationships and perinatal mental health, parenting support and infant feeding. Those are the focus points. Through the guidance for the programme, we have set up a partnership board that is necessary for the delivery of the programme and has representation from across the partnership. There is a transformation team again set out in the guidance that we have to have to sort out the coordination, delivery and reporting associated with the programme and all of that is integrated into our early intervention system governance so it ends up eventually feeding up into the safeguarding partnership board. Oh. There we go. 
So this is just to give a flavor of the sorts of investments that we've made through the program that runs until March 2025. So in this idea of a dedicated 1,001 days offer, we have recruited 12 FTE early days worker posts so that there's one per hub and they are integrated into the delivery of a single 1,001 days offer with midwives and health visitors. Um, they are currently in post and starting to build those relationships. The early days worker has five contacts with families shaped by our parent and carer panel and previous experience through the 1,001 days pilot funded through the Better Care Fund and is focused on building relationships and offering a, a holistic single point of contact throughout that 0-2 to two time period. The improved parenting support comes from investment in various parenting models that are evidence-based and supported by central government. So that includes um, Triple P and it also includes EPEC. Now EPEC is Empowering Parents, Empowering Communities. It is focused on that sort of parent craft and peer support offer that we have invested in. The increased capacity for targeted support and early help is a really important one for us. We feel like family hubs play and need to play an integral role in delivering that more targeted support locally so that it's more accessible to families, feels part of a universal offer and reduces some of the stigma associated with um, accessing that more targeted support. So we've invested in four family hub pathway workers to, uh, for those familiar with the threshold guidance work at level three, um, of those thresholds and hold early help cases and be lead practitioners with families and we've also invested in two um, family hub pathway leads to improve the capacity for case supervision so that the overall number of families that can be supported is improved but also integrate more targeted support into the family hub offer so that it can be delivered locally in a more accessible way. As mentioned, we've got the Talking Together pathway that we've invested in, um, which is speech and language therapy led and focused on making sure that the pressures of the pandemic on child development and speech and language are addressed effectively and reduces the burden on SEM processes when um, we're noticing a lot of children um, don't necessarily meet the SEM threshold, they just need socialization and a bit of additional support, which is provided through that pathway. The specialist health visiting and midwifery roles, these are focused on perinatal mental health and parent and infant relationships. So we've got two perinatal mental health health visitors. They bridge the gap between information advice and guidance and clinical support provided to parents with diagnosed perinatal mental health issues. And then we've also in the process of recruiting a community midwifery and neonatal support worker and two early parent infant emotional well-being workers. Now those three roles collectively with those two previously mentioned specialist health visitors will provide Doncaster for the first time with a dedicated targeted support for families that are having issues with attachment and bonding and low level mental health needs, which is really important as we know for stopping demand further along in the journey of a family and a child and also into more complex services. The focus community engagement is important. So this comes in various forms. We're investing in peer support networks such as those delivered in the Changing Lives Community Hub via midwifery. We've invested via midwifery again to support the amount of contact that, uh, content that is accessible to those um, deaf and hard of hearing. Um, and we also have two dedicated community engagement work spread across the borough that have sort of three roles really. One is to work with the parent and carer panel, build those relationships, get that insight. The second is to work with the voluntary sector and understand the support they need um, and how we can get them more involved in the offer. And the third um, 
and most important in my opinion is working to identify the underserved communities and residents in Doncaster that currently don't access the Family Hub offer. We have the data to know where that is and know the locations and know the communities, but we haven't had the capacity to directly engage with them in a targeted way before. So that's what those two roles will do. And then just on the right hand side, we've expanded and integrated the staff training offer. So it's a single offer across the council and health providers. We've improved the family hubs um, sort of aesthetically and with some sort of rejuvenation efforts to make them as functional and attractive as possible to drive forward um, engagement from families. And again, those two parent engagement mechanisms, one of them is the parent and carer panel. The other one, given the stigma and sensitivity around it, we have set up a separate parent and carer panel focused on perinatal mental health. We've recruited an expert by experience um, to run that, and we are in the process of recruiting volunteers to inform our perinatal mental health offer. And then we're also looking at how we can maximize the impact and scope of volunteers on our offer to make sure it reaches as far as possible. And that's me. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Um, I can't see anybody that wishes to come in. Nabil. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Callum. Um, yeah, really, really encouraging. Um, I, I said at the beginning, my uh, practice in, in Bentley as well as looks after Sproper and um, and Scorthorpe and, and that side of things about targeting those communities um, which don't use those um, uh, assets as well. Um, really, really welcome to hear. Um, I just felt, I just wondered with the sort of the refresh and the changes, this might be a good time to go out to GP practices and probably colleagues in DBTH and Ardash actually about what's going on at the family hubs and, and that side of things. Um, I think we know them by name. We probably don't know a lot of the detail of them and if that's changing. And I expect if you asked um, colleagues at DBTH as well, they'd have sort of uh, less than what we know as, as GPs. And, and it's that kind of thing of actually that signposting we can do better once we know um, what's, what's going on. And also particularly if we targeted some of those practices in those areas um, and things and getting those new link workers to come and engage, you know, at least offer to the practice to come and talk to us um, about it and educate. Hopefully that will help drive uptake as well. No, that's a, a really valid point. Thank you. Um, we have recently invested in some dedicated comms support for the rest of this financial year. Their first task was driving the programme over the summer through a series of events and raising the awareness of this additional support to families and their next task once that franticness has passed which is hopefully in the next few days will be to create a dedicated comms plan for that internal and partnership comms but yeah thank you okay i think we'd be keen that the focus was on um gps and you know so that they are they're, they're the people that perhaps kind of what can uh, inform people about what's going on so if they could be first on the list of of comms i think as a board would welcome that pauline i have got to move things on so unless it's an urgent point Okay, so perhaps we can have that as an action, please, Callum, that you work with Pauline in terms of the family hubs, but great to hear about the maternity services and people being si uh, learning the language, so that's good news. So if that's one of the actions that we can take to make that contact with family centres and the request that health colleagues are quite uh, high on the priority in terms of engagement, that would be really good. 
Unless anybody has any comments, I'm going to move us on and just very aware of the time. So looking at the next two reports, which is John and Alan, we've got the reports in the pack. Um, John, I'm not expecting you to go through this because we really haven't got a lot of time. We've all been kept up to date very much on the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission. So what I would ask you to do is, are there like three key things that you want from us as a board that you really want to focus on, please? Thank you. Yeah, OK, thanks. Uh, thanks for the welcome. So um, uh, what, yeah, what I was planning on doing is giving an, an update on where we're at. This is an interim update of where we're at within the Fairness Commission. We have not finished all the sessions yet, but we wanted to come along today, probably about a year or so on from when the, the, the initial discussions were had uh, here at Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, uh, so I guess what I would be interested on uh, in the thoughts in the room are really around feedback on the process and progress so far, and also initial considerations within the room about how the Health and Wellbeing Board would want to receive and consider the recommendations at, uh, and the evidence that is coming out of the Commission. And that uh, needs to be given in the context of some of the, that evidence and recommendations will be about short-term changes that we can make, and some of them will be... Uh, about longer term systemic changes and that will kind of dovetail into what Alan will talk about um, within uh, his item too. Um, I won't give um, loads of background then around, around the commission. I, I know first of all numbers of people in the room are, are members of that commission and also uh, you've seen, uh, seen the evidence pack. What I will probably just whiz on to then Uh, just a, a, a few things to, to consider then. So um, we, across this commission, we have brought in a, a significant range of evidence to uh, the commission members. I, won't, I certainly won't list things uh, off the screen, but there, there, there is a wide range of quantitative and qualitative evidence that has been brought forward to the commission looking at across an age band. So looking at uh, older people, working age adults, and we are currently uh, halfway through the work we're doing on children and young people. Uh, as part of that, we have built now a library of evidence that we have uh, across those age bands, and we've spent a lot of time and uh, energy building a set of personas around the, the sorts of people and the, and the sorts of lived experiences we have now uh, in, in Doncaster. So that is available and that is uh, published and will be continue to be published as the, as the, as the, as the commission sort of concludes. Uh, as I say, we're, we're, we're just finishing our sort of evidence sessions at the moment. Uh, the recommendations will have a, a, a format, so we are looking at, um, which th th I think the board will be familiar with, with the sort of three horizons model, so what are the longer term systemic shifts that we want to make as a system, but what are the, the things that we need to be putting in place now as actions to get towards that, and what are the initial um, sort of uh, the quicker wins that we can make as a system, or initial things that we have within the system at the moment that can amplify, amplify that. What those recommendations are looking like at the moment, they are still in draft format, and uh, we'll be certainly interested in uh, what uh, any, any feedback in the room around what, uh, what, what either the commissioners or members of the Health and Wellbeing Board are f feeling about the recommendations we've got so far and any input they would like to make that. We definitely see that we are, they're in a draft format at the moment, and we would certainly be interested in feedback on them. Um, as I said, and it will lead into the next item very nicely, there will be a range of issues uh, and forums and uh, sort of policy opportunities that we have locally and regionally that uh, can fit into. Uh, and this is our sort of, uh, our timeline will take us through into sort of late autumn where we want the report. I appreciate, I've kind of rushed through that in a uh, very quick sort of fashion, which hopefully people have read uh, the materials in advance. Uh, I guess with that in mind, I'm, I'm happy to go back to anything if people have got questions on people, anything they want to clarify, but maybe helpful to just jump back into the, the sort of the initial prompt I had around any, any kind of feedback in the room around um, process and progress so far, and also how the Health and Wellbeing Board would want to be, continue to be involved, uh, specifically thinking about how the recommendation should land. Yep, thank you for that excellent summary as well, John. That is appreciated. Comments? I've got Anthony... Yeah, thank, thanks for the update, John, and um, I think the approach that's been given to this has been a good one. The right mix, I think, of um, theoretical work that we could bring to this and, and um, research, but also what I was going to get to, John, is I think this needs to be pitched in the tangible as well. So when the... Um, when the I was just looking for the time frames. When, when the final commissioning report is published for the public... I would have thought that they would expect 
we are going to do such and such based on what this what you have told us but the results research has told us as well so i think it would be a missed opportunity i think this commission not to come out with some tangible elements of what we're going to do uh, yeah absolutely and i think that we would want the a pragmatic mix of things that are visionary and uh, really set the tone in terms of the, the sort of place that we want to be but also tangible things that we can do um, the other thing I, I should have said, this is going to sound a bit naff, but um, the sort of the, the end of this timeline is, is really the, the beginning rather than the end, because this is um, the whole point of this is it sets a tone and it sets a legacy and, and recommendations do fall out. So yes, we're going through a process, but that process should actually have impact and um, uh, yeah, make a difference locally. Thanks, John. Bill? There was a bit of an overlap, I think, between the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission and us, um, because I guess we're, we're focused on whatever word we use, inequality or disparity, um, and the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission is focused on identifying and, and addressing that. And I think um, the question I want to ask John is, it's difficult to do it, even if we had a long item, it'd be difficult to do it in this room. What help do you need from members of this board to make sure that they and their organisations are tied in to making sure that we do have some tangible outcomes that come out of the, of the Commission? So, so there's a real delicate balance with the commission. Yes, it is an independent body and it needs to make sort of its own sort of sovereign recommendations, but they can't be they can't be in a vacuum. So I, I think what would be helpful is um, those recommendations as they shape up over the uh, I was going to say the summer, but what's what's left of the summer and the sort of into the autumn. Actually, that could be done in a slightly more co-productive way. So how can those recommendations be shaped? As yes, this is the input that commissioners have had, but how can they be built in a way that can land locally so they don't it's not so independent that the recommendations land in a local system in a sort of um a sort of plonked there yeah they, they need to yeah so it's them, them to be pragmatically co-produced i think would be helpful and also having the right sort of staging in terms of what does the health and wellbeing board want to look at a year after the recommendations have come out and what is a suitable sort of reporting back in and, and how are they sort of taken as ownership across the system certainly not the commission's job or the commissioner's job to to do all the work it's how does that kind of influence the whole system i think okay i think i can't see any other hands what i'd be keen with this is that um yes we commissioned this as a health and well-being board and the expectation was that it was always come back here and what we can't do as a health and well-being as, as board as phil has said is is, is influence in a way what the outcomes are but what I think we've got to do is have something we have need to have that really meaningful dialogue um, so I'm just trying to think very quickly about how we do that and one suggestion might be that we have a small working group from the health and well-being board that are not on the commission to almost work with the commission to put something together. But what I wouldn't want to do is lose any of those recommendations because if I'd spent months on the commission, which I know a number of people had, I would expect to see what I wanted come out of it, but then want it to be in a tangible action that can actually be action. Because I know some of the things that may come out, we had it earlier from Phil, is care home costs. We are not as a health and wellbeing board gonna have any impact on that but that doesn't mean we shouldn't reflect it in one of the um, recommendations. Looking, pleadingly to colleagues about how we do this in a way that's incredibly meaningful, because this for me is the work of the Health and Wellbeing Board over the next couple of years, isn't it? What comes out of this? Sorry, I'm getting excited and hitting the mic. We have got to um, implement it. Any thoughts? Thanks. Um, I think there's something for me that really joins up with the next agenda item as well. So the work we've been doing in terms of the health and wellbeing strategy refresh and then the one Doncaster plan, because they should also be doing the bit of, so what are we actually going to do? So we're link we've been linking up. We've linked up with the findings so far from the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission and the personas. So I don't know if there's something about, we've already got a working group that's trying to pull those two strands together. So in effect, I think we're possibly doing it, but maybe just we need to strengthen it a bit more and then be clearer for the health and wellbeing board in terms of what that looks like. We've got some timeframes in terms of particularly the one Doncaster plan and the health and wellbeing strategy refresh that run for the rest of this year. But we can look to say, but how do we then keep taking that forward? So we don't get to the end of that process and then say, oh, 
and I, we're not finishing then taking forward the work from the commission as well so it might be we can just have a bit of a relook at that group particularly like a really good suggestion thank you Elsa. thank you john um the minority partnership as you know uh, have been pulling together a group of people from diverse background in doncaster and have been looking into uh, submitting something the next two weeks and i'm um, just checking that that is still in terms of the timetable there still okay uh, yeah that's absolutely fine and also we, we have a we do need to close the window at some point but th there is opportunities over what's left of the summit for organizations wh whatever they are to submit evidence into the um uh the call for evidence so that is still there if needed but thank you okay so we've got a suggestion from elsa that we look at the board that's looking at the health and well-being strategy and how we bring that together but i'm also aware that not everybody's on that so i'll leave that with elsa and john and perhaps alan to look at how that's strengthened my personal view is, is this is such a big thing. We've not done this in Doncaster before in terms of the commission. So I would like a, an extra meeting of this board to look at how we then look at those recommendations. It may be that we don't have a November meeting as such, but the whole, the whole session is just looking at those recommendations. Or people may feel more comfortable that we have that discussion in private and we arrange another workshop to do that. But I would ask John to work with health colleagues, Phil, et cetera, to look at how we do that. Does that make sense? But I'm also very aware that there's people in the room that aren't on the commission but are on this board. So you, we can work out those timescales. Almost what I'd like to see is where the health and wellbeing board members come in and what's expected them of, of expected of them of when. Is that okay? Anybody not happy with that approach? Okay, thank you for that, John. And so um, we've got the actions there that are minuted. We're then going to move on to... Um, the health and well-being strategy, which again we have had a report on, which I expect that everybody has read. Um, this clearly within the report demonstrates the timescales which are linked to receiving the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission report. So I think, Alan, all you're looking for is this, is that um, the, the way that it's been outlined, which we have discussed before, and to check that we're happy with the timescales. Is that all? There is more, but that's that's enough. That's enough. Anything you want to add, Alan, that you think people might not have missed, that might have missed in the report? Uh, I, I think I think it's all there. Uh, um, I, I'm happy to take questions and comments. I think the most important thing for me is that we are trying to do an awful lot of alignment and making sure that, that collaborative approach is there. There's an awful lot of strategy work happened in Doncaster over the last two and a half years, which impacts well-being and we need to maybe be cognizant of that and understand how that works together and the second thing is we need to actually do stuff and make things work so the commission the one looks to plan are all part of this and that working group the suggestion we've just had i think that's a really good way to take it forward okay has anybody got any further comments thank you it was just really i wanted to pick up on the bit that we've got it's in the report around engagement and picking up on the comment that was made earlier and i know we've made before around the south yorkshire joint forward plan and we did have a discussion before around engagement and working with our population in terms of the one plan for doncaster we have started on that work in terms of what we're wanting to do we've done some work to make sure that we have gathered together the engagement we've got already because some of the feedback we've got is don't keep coming out and talking to us when we've said this to you before so we've done that bit and what we've done is try to pull together what that what we think that's telling us and we're now at the stage of going back out to our communities to test that out to say have we heard this right at the same time as doing that we're also wanting to make sure we can work out ways that we can really start on like that co-production journey in terms of not define what the end product looks like but to work out to say if this if what we've heard is right how do we form a plan that helps to start to address that and define what the future would look like for people in Doncaster in a way that makes sense for people in Doncaster. So we're starting that piece of work as well. We'll bring a much more full report back when we come back, but I just wanted to highlight that today, bearing in mind the earlier conversation. Okay, Alan, did you want to? No, that, that, that's okay. Any other comments? that people want to make on this. We're happy with the timescales because they're probably a little bit longer than we initially thought, I would say. You can understand why, because obviously we need to get the commission recommendations in. You've got our full support, Alan, on this approach. So um, thank you ever so much.
And so that's, we're happy with the proposal for the development and we're also happy with the indicative timescales. Okay, nobody disagreeing with that? Thank you very much. So we're now going to move on to item 13, which is alcohol use in over 15, over 15, over 50s, over 15 would be a bit worrying, wouldn't it? Over 50s women and emerging trends. Vicky and Andy, welcome. What I would say to you is that we have all had the presentation. Take this as your opportunity to get actions out of us rather than just presenting facts to us. Is that okay? It's an opportunity for you to highlight the key things that you think we need to know as a health and wellbeing board, which will then help us come up with actions that all partners need to, to do to address the issues that you're concerned about. Sorry. Yeah, so just a brief introduction. My name is Andy Collins, work for Public Health, one of the commissioners of Aspire, and I have a particular focus and responsibility to reduce alcohol related harm here in Doncaster. Vicky, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Vicky. I'm the chief exec of Project Six. Okay, so so people have seen seen the data. The data, I'm, re I'm really concerned about, you know, uh, hospital alcohol related admissions for women. Um, as you can see, the, the one that's up there, I know it's very, very um, a long way away, but, you know, we are worst. In the, in the Yorkshire Humber for a number of indicators around women being admitted for alcohol-related conditions. Uh, that one, the first one is liver disease. Um, the second one um, here is, is around uh, admission episodes for alcohol-related conditions for females, and we are third worst in the Yorkshire and Humber. Um, actually, on, in, on the numbers, we're actually having more uh, than Barnsley or Rotherham are above us, but obviously it's just a smaller, a smaller demographic of uh, town for Barnsley and Rotherham. Um, the second one there, I'm particularly focused around 40 and 64 years. That's why the, the title was over 50. Uh, and we are worst in the Yorkshire and Humber there um, for over um, admissions between 40 and 64. Um, Rupert often says, you know, about making the invisible visible. A lot of these, a lot of these, you know, women coming in for an alcohol-specific admission are invisible. A lot of them will be drinking at, at home, uh, and, and they are invisible until they end up at, at DRI. We know that uh, they, it costs uh, 17.2 million pounds here in Doncaster to the NHS every year for alcohol, uh, and you know, I'm really concerned about, um, you know. The, women being coming in. We often stereotype, you know, uh, drinkers as, you know, male, um, with a ruddy face, street drinkers. That's not that's not the case. Um, is there anything you want to add? I'm really conscious of time, but I really wanted to go through these slides, but is there anything you want to add from your side of it, uh, Vicky? Yeah, so there are, there's a couple of pieces of research that I think are really pertinent to this. So Andy and I have been talking about this for a little while. You could come to the next one, Chris. Cheers. So there's a DrinkWise Age Well research. DrinkWise Age Well was a national project ran, I think, in five or six areas across the country. Project Six was part of delivering that in um, Sheffield. And we looked specifically at the needs of alcohol users over 50. It was funded by the National Lottery. Um, and we identified that it's the invisible visible point that actually nearly most adults over 50 who were drinking harmfully or hazardously had not been screened by anyone in the healthcare setting. Most people had no idea what safe drinking levels were. Um, and then we know when we started delivery that actually engagement in services increased when we started offering specialist services as well. And that this work can reduce hospital admissions. Yeah. Can we click to the next one, please? Mm. And then the second bit of research is particularly, um, and this is kind of a passion of mine, because in addition to being Chief Executive of Project 6, I, I work in the research department of Manchester University looking particularly at women and women's access to drug and alcohol services. And we know that the nationally, the drive to create integrated treatment services has created services, that, that alongside austerity has created services that really only meet the needs of male opioid users. And that's a national picture and that's something that's reflected in, in Doncaster. That, that's the feedback we have from the women that we've been supporting as well. Um, we know women face extra additional barriers about engaging. They can quite often be sat in a waiting area with someone who they may have experienced domestic abuse or sexual violence from. Um, and there's lots of levels of stigma and challenges around that. There's a good report that's run by um, We Are With You, and the details of that are in the pack as well. So we have been delivering bespoke support to over 50s alcohol users for over a year now, commissioned first of all by Well Doncaster and now by the public health team. We've supported 112 folk, 46 were women, so that's a pretty good 
pretty good average accessing women and we ask the women what why what's happening to you and your alcohol what's happening to you in your life that's causing you a challenge with alcohol and the key issues are around lo loss of um relationship breakdown so sometimes you get women who've been in a relationship for years and they might not even have their own bank account the car's not in their name the house isn't in their name the kids leave home they're left with without any tools actually of, of leaving that relationship. So they might look happy on the outside, but there's a lot of isolation within the family unit for them. Shame, stigma, massive issues for women seeking support around drugs and alcohol. Uh, people feeling lost or lost, stuck with a loss of status when they've retired as well. So especially people that lose their family identity and their work identity at the same time, that can be really challenging for people. And we know that when people lose the structures around employment, if they've always had a propensity to drink harmfully, then that alcohol use can increase. And managing menopause as well, and symptoms of the, the physiological and psychological symptoms of the menopause as well. So there's a number of reasons why women do need a, a bespoke service. And we know that the service that we offer, if we can go to the next slide, we've got evidence that actually we can, uh, the women reported valuing an accessible, bespoke, non-clinical service. And 87% of the women we have supported they agree that their mental health um, had improved and 75 said the physical health has improved so we're starting to get the outcomes and the data um, that a, a bespoke approach does does particularly work there's a couple of videos there we won't show them but I would encourage you to to watch them there's Dot and Anne uh, talking quite frankly about their experiences around their their alcohol use as well so I guess our our ask is um, it's about developing, designing and developing services with women at the centre that are bespoke for women and aren't gender blind in, in their approach. Hmm. I, mean, I just want to just add uh, just the data there, you know, that I, a lot of people can see that, but alcohol specific mortality, this is for males and females in 2021, Doncaster is the worst in the Yorkshire and Humber for people dying from alcohol. wanted to, uh, so I'm happy to um, I think sorry if you could just take your mic off one of you so, okay so the, the data is clear Andy I think we've all got that even if we'd have sat here for an hour I don't think the data changes we have a problem in Doncaster with women's healthy life expectancy and alcohol is one strand of that in my opinion. We've sat here as a health and wellbeing board and quite frankly as a chair I'm ashamed that in the country we have the third worst healthy life expectancy for women. We are not the third worst in terms of deprived, we are not the third worst in terms of anything else but for women's healthy life expectancy that's where we are and we have got to change that and I think this board has got to lead that change and, and, and alcohol and Vicky you summed it up in terms of why people perhaps turn to alcohol and what is happening. Um, and it's multifaceted what is happening to women. So I see our response to this as being part of, of not losing it, but of being part of a bigger women's health strategy, looking to public health colleagues that we desperately need in Doncaster, because those figures are absolutely dreadful. And anybody in whatever service, we've all got responsibilities. So I'll take, I'll stop ranting and I'll get on to Phil and Nabil. Yeah, you know, I think that's why you asked at the start for some specific asks. And, I, and it's probably, without being too melodramatic, we probably need to cut to the chase, don't we? So I think we've known for a while that um, the disparity that women experience in Doncaster isn't satisfactory. I think Andy would say as well that there's a parity of esteem issue, of esteem issue in relation to alcohol. And, how, and the focus we give on avoidable harm arising from alcohol. So I suppose the question we have to ask ourselves is, we don't want to keep bringing reports here that, that may be, I mean, the colleagues are right to bring the report, by the way, but we don't want to get to the stage where we're bringing another report in a few months that perfor performs the fact that we're not doing enough, but w while we're not clear about the mechanisms for what we are doing, um, we're not clear about how we might be supporting and reducing alcohol-related harm in a joined up way. We're not clear about how we're prioritizing um, improving outcomes for women. So it feels to me like I'm not hearing how that work's being done. So I think that's probably the bit we need to drill into. 
Okay, so uh, Vicky and Andy, did you want to come back at that about how? Then. So just so other areas have got alcohol care teams, and and they work up at you know, up at the up the local hospitals. Um, we haven't got one here in Doncaster. We've got one drug and alcohol nurse who works Monday to Friday. Other areas have got a seven day service with lots of different staff. I'm currently working with. Uh, Emma Safozo and Kayleigh Harper from the Integrated Care Board looking at how we bring one uh, up to, to, to DRI. There's no new money, unfortunately. So it's about how, how, do we, how do we use the existing envelope differently and more effectively. Um, so that's, so I, don't, I don't think that answers your question, but I really just thought, you know, we need one here in Doncaster. We're trying hook by crook to get one. Unfortunately, we just you know can't dip into a you know you know more money and just and just it's a, it's a slow process. I'm trying to say. Oh no, that you've made that clear, Andy. I'm just thinking. I'm, again, I'm looking to colleagues. Where do we make those decisions? Because it's not the health and wellbeing board in terms of what services we provide. Uh, Ailsa. Thank you. Um, we are currently just trying to unpick what we have got that we think we yeah. could use to actually then try and form that. Um, more team-based approach. So we've got a number of different roles across different services that are commissioned. So we are trying to unpick that to say, can we actually do something much better in terms of using that resource? As you say, it's difficult because there's nothing else that's happened to, but we don't think that we're coordinating what we've then got and we could probably use it better. So I'm, I'm sure, sure people should be linking in with you, Andy, but we'll make sure that we do as we try and unpick what we've got from a health perspective. Perfect. Great, thank you. Rachel, I'm just trying to catch up here. There was there was some work to identify women's health champions in local authorities and DPHs, wasn't there? That was led by um, Kathy, chief nurse over at South Yorkshire. Have, have you had any contact, or has Rachel? No, I'll chase up on that, please. Okay, but also picking up Vicky's point in terms of services. Yeah, um, myself and Andy have had various versions of this discussion, you know, several times over the um, over the years. But obviously, it's looking and feeling more stark now. Um, I, I, I felt that there's three, I guess, there's three parts of the, the pathway in terms of wh where we focus on things. So, so one is, I guess, the um, that early um, intervention uh, side of things, um, and that feels like that key thing about the services not being co-produced and co-designed in a way that um, uh, our women in this age group are, are happy accessing. And that's a national thing, obviously, as, as Vicky said, but seeing as we are number three, number one or in, in Yorkshire, actually, I think we need to push on saying that we're not happy with that, even if other people are, are happy with that. So I think that's one of the things I guess we push in terms of recommendation. Um, the second thing is when there is sort of picking up the early harm um, side of things. So again, um, Andy and, and, and others have been involved with that discussions about the fibre scans and, and having that technology out there in the community which people can access rather than having to go through GP refers to hospital, hospital do that test to look for early signs of damage that doesn't show up on, on an ultrasound. So um, again, I think sort of seeing what's happening with that and that's rolled out in a way that Andy's highlighted before Nottingham has a really good model and bringing that to Doncaster and using that this is a reason for why we you know, push on that to be faster and then the third point I was going to make is for those people further along um, but that's been picked up about actually what the inpatient offer is inpatient not inpatient um, offer is different in, in Doncaster to other other places and clearly if what we've got doesn't mirror what's available in other places and we have a bigger need, then that doesn't feel um, very comfortable. And even if that's the case of if there is no money, do we then say this is actually a priority and we move money, not just from other bits within the alcohol system, but actually from somewhere else in the system to support this effort? Okay, thank you. And I know certainly in terms of health and wellbeing board chairs across South Yorkshire, we all meet with the ICP and we all had an opportunity to put priorities forward and this was one priority that we put forward. Um, we haven't yet had the meeting to discuss it with everybody else's priorities but it is there so it's on the South Yorkshire wide agenda but clearly we've got an issue to address it in Doncaster. So Elsa, if I've heard correctly, there's some work already undertake going on that Vicky and Andy can link into to get the reassurance that we understand what services are available 
and then the work will be done to change the current services? What's the plan? I think the short answer to that is yes, in terms of the work being done to change what we've got. Um, I'm convinced it's there's more that we can do with the resources that we have um, and I think Andy you just said you've got a meeting with certainly the right people from our perspective next week which is great so we are trying to pull that forward and yes we need to change then what we've got and come back and challenge it and make sure that it starts to become more effective. Thank you. Did you want to come back? Yeah I think I totally agree about the, the, the screening that can be done without any extra income because that's actually that that's part of people's role. This isn't just a health solution and it feels like to me in Doncaster and I might be about to speak out of line here but alcohol is quite often an issue that's batted around between it's not dealt with as an integrated issue and it is absolutely an integrated issue it's public health it's health but it's also social issues if social issues are driving this then there absolutely needs to be an integrated approach to that and needs, that needs to involve the voluntary and community sector and we need to put the women at the absolute heart of this piece of work. So it sounds like some great work started, but actually for me, the opportunities are when we sit down with a group of women and say, how can we redesign some of this with your needs in mind? Okay, thank you, Vicky. So the women, oh, Victor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to kind of start by acknowledging the great work um, Andy and Vicky and the team, and team are doing. Uh, the point um, that Phil mentioned is an important one in terms of uh, what do we do about it. And we've heard from the dementia case study, which I think is a very good one to kind of uh, link it to case studies, how progress are being made. Um, and you've given some good statistics there, Vicky, about um, uh, those who have engaged with the service, how um, how good it is. I think the, the the point I want to mention, uh, emphasize is the emphasis on the prevention aspect. Obviously, people who are already at the stage you described there are needing um, secondary care intervention, uh, they need to be helped. But there are those that are kind of um, about to or uh, about, about uh, at the age of need. Um, and even before, so it's about the awareness, the, the, the awareness uh, Way way back in the general population, I know some work has been going, even in in, in young people as well, uh, because it starts much much earlier on, uh, in 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 life. So, it was really kind of focusing on the prevention aspect of of the work. Okay, so I'm hearing we need to co-produce something as we've done with the dementia strategy. Is that something that somebody is going to be able to pick up? Because clearly we need to do that. So I think Vicky's right with her challenge and there's a level of, probably using the wrong words, level of primary prevention activity, community work, social work to pull together. And maybe Vicky can help us think about that, how we connect that with our primary care networks as well, where we're thinking, where are the cohorts of people that we might want to start differently with pulling together a range of, of, of people and not just medicalizing the problem. And I think there's also the need to think about our secondary prevention and thinking about, I mean, what I heard, again, it was, it's, I guess it's disputable, but what I heard was we're spending millions on this already, just in the wrong way. So it wasn't about how can we find some money to do something new, it's how can we do something different to probably save millions of pounds in the way that people are sadly having to present at the moment. So. I think it's both things, but I definitely agree, definitely want to support Vicky with how do we pull together something that probably in the first instance will be almost a, a locality, community test of change with some clinicians and partners who are motivated to work with a cohort a bit differently. So I think we could, we could start to explore that. Thank you, Phil. And I think, are you happy with that, Vicky? Would that, yeah, it comes up. Andy, does that? Okay. Uh, Quick one from me, Chair. Very much uh, well done, Castor. Really happy to support with the co-production and co-design. So please get in touch, Vicky. Okay, and then I think it's for another. I wholly support what um, Vicky said, but forgive me, I can't remember the timescales. But either prior COVID or pre-COVID, um, or during COVID, there was a discussion around PCN networks embedding an alcohol worker. Did that ever come to fruition? 
Okay, so that that was sort of our older people's alcohol worker does work from Scott Street, so okay. we are embedded in in some GP practices. Yeah. We've we've managed to That's achieve that for, for the older people's alcohol. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I kind of thought that model might work, maybe stretched out further. Yes, it yeah. would. Okay, so I, I, we've got the actions there that there's Phil and Ailsa, sorry to put you down Phil, but Phil and Ailsa are involved about how we develop this and I think I need a conversation with public health colleagues about a wider wellbeing strategy because we don't need to wait for the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission to tell us that women's healthy life expectancy is a problem because we need that. Hey Richard. Yeah, thank you Chair. Um, mine is a sort of general comment in terms of, of Obviously, today's um, meeting, we've heard quite a lot of, um, if you like, pleas for assistance and help with changing services and changing the way we deliver services and, and making fundamental change that will benefit people in the future. And on a practical day-to-day -day basis, we're wrestling with trying to provide the services now in a way that meet the current needs. One of the pieces of work I think we've got to do, you know, as a health and social care community is is work out how we get headspace because Phil's right um, we're spending lots of money probably on the wrong things but there has to be a transition point where you create the headspace and in essence you create the funding to change because at some point you have to double run the services whilst you make the transition and that I think is our fundamental challenge in the next year or two is how do we in Doncaster create headspace to actually fund the things that we think are going to be the long-term benefits that will save money because if we do both things together what we'll have is just gaps because people's expectations of what we can provide are often much greater than the reality at the moment of what's available and I think that is the fundamental piece of work that we've got to do strategically is work out how to bridge the gaps. Thank you Richard. Is that being picked up at the place board, the place committee or...? Yes, but more to do. I mean, that's exactly the conversations we need to get into. Um, and headspace is, is the word for that. So we are going to get together our chief executives and our non-executive members as well, Rachel, um, to have a look about, you know, are we really in the proper space of that forward thinking that we need to do whilst we're dealing with the here and now? Okay. Okay, Vicky and Andy, happy with that progress and you'll be linked into the, the right people. I do apologise, I never go over time, but we, we have done today because we've had a really packed agenda. Um, and I think, we, you know, when we're talking about lived experience, it's so important that we don't stop those conversations. So, Michael, perhaps the really important, <laughs> a really, really important item agenda is obviously the BCF funding, um, which obviously should underpin everything that our priorities are, shouldn't it? So picking up Richard's point and Anthony's point in terms of headspace and how much money we're spending, you'll probably explain to us about the BCF funding because in my simple head, that should be allocated to where our priorities are. Thank you, Michael. Over to you. You've just got 10 minutes, if that's okay. Okay, so Better Care Fund, uh, essentially it's intended to support health and social care um, services to work together to provide improved and joined up care and support. It's a government initiative that's spread over a number of departments, bringing together existing resources from the NHS and local authorities into a single pool budget. So in terms of, in terms of Doncaster, um, what was different this time round is it was a, a two year um, em funding envelope. Um, in terms of new money, uh, there's, there's a significant uplift in the discharge fund element um, of BCF next year, and I believe there's going to be an extra, uh, an extra uplift of about 8.7% in terms of um, disabled facilities grants, which will come out in the autumn. So there's been an uplift overall, uh, but that's swallowed up also by inflationary costs, and we, we're still not certain on the pay award outcome either so a lot of services are, are sort of delivered internally so more money but less to go around um, 54 million this year 56 million next year we've also got an earmark reserve fund which is essentially for transformational temporary projects um, where there's a commitment of 3.8 million uh, currently and still 627,000 to allocate for this financial year that doesn't need to be spent this year, but we like to make sure that we're, we're using the, the investments wisely 
um, I say a number of those temporary schemes are coming to an end. So um, that's that's uh, we're looking at exit planning at the moment. In terms of cost centres, um, the, the biggest cost centre really is intermediate care. So that's short term support needs, uh, usually for around six to eight weeks. Uh, for people, you know, leaving hospital um, to prevent them coming back into hospital. Um, the next big, biggest cost centre is um, supporting with discharges, and then the rest are made up of, I suppose, prevention, early intervention approaches, but also statutory requirements, both within NHS and local authority. This is the main slide I'd like to focus on. So, in terms of our commitment to government, what we said we we're going to do, and and really for the board to endorse. Um, avoidable admissions are, are on the rise. Um, we've got a target of, of improving that by 7% this year, uh, which is committed to as part of the Aging Well Plan. And um, and yet we're, we're seeing avoidable admissions peaking be before pre-COVID rates at the moment uh, for quarter one. Um, falls is a new target area that we're focusing on uh, this year. So previously it's not been... Um, something that we reported to government on, but we, we'd be setting a 5% reduction there, focusing on really the early intervention prevention sort of strategies, um, really practical approaches to, to how we can um, support falls. In terms of discharges, discharges to usual place of residence, so people end up going back to where they uh, came from before. Um, our target is 95% um, as, as part of a national target. We want to reduce residential admissions. Um, so there's a whole host of implementation going off across, including you know home first approach to supporting people. Um, uh, so discharge to assess, get get getting home, and and a whole whole host of um, um, work that's being picked up um, through the UEC board. Reablement. That's essentially how we can support people to stay at home for. Um, 91 days is, is the sort of government target and again we're looking at how we can um, you know, work, work better in terms of um, supporting with the data because previously data has been a little unreliable so how can we get a more accurate picture of what's going off across place um, and then delivering against those outcomes. So the top priorities um, for Doncaster um, really it's about Understanding what can we do differently, which feeds into the previous conversation we've just had. What can we stop commissioning um, uh, through exit planning strategies? Um, how we can get engage different partners, different voices to support with some of the challenges. Um, some of that could be low cost, no cost offers, of course. Um, how we can align our system planning more closely to what the intelligence is telling us. So it's not specifically data, it's you know, the analysis of data, it's observations, it's people with lived experience. And and ultimately, it's about delivering better outcomes for, for patients, residents, um, across health and social care, and, and getting value for money or services, because we know things are getting more tricky. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Phil? Just got I just two things, maybe just to challenge you a bit, Councillor, on um, just what the yeah yeah taking my life in my hands so that there are two objectives for the better care fund that are in grant conditions um the first one is broadly it, they're loose in the headings but the detail is, is kind of revealing so the first one is enable people to stay well safe and independent at home for longer the narrative is about um to improve quality of life and reduce pressure on urgent emergency care acute and social care services and then a set of ways that that could be achieved so it's so that the, it's it's perceived as kind of an invest to save fund in that sense so that it perfectly links well with the alcohol item we've just had in, invest in something save some money the second objective which again is euphemistically described as to have provide people with the right care the right place at the right time the narrative is to tackle immediate pressures in delayed discharges and demand for hospital attendances and admissions and bringing about improvements for people discharged and wider system flow. So the pie chart that Mike showed shows that over half the money goes into that. Might not be spent in the best way, but that over half the money's there. 
the other stuff on the left hand side a little bit of that, that stuff will also be supporting discharge but you know so it's important it's, this isn't a fund that is set up to support everything that this health and well-being board might want to do but it is a fund that should be used wisely and if it is used wisely it will generate the potential in our health and care providers to do more preventative work because we're we're investing to make the best impact. Just wanted to get that across. That's fine. And so, is it? Would you say, Michael, it's working up to now that we have invested wisely and it is having those impacts in on the health? I can more we can do. More, much more we can do. I think there's lots of levers we can pull. I think funding's one lever. I think you know funding's not going to solve you know exchanging one service for another ultimately you've got you know workforce development which we've touched on today communications digital um you know there's there's a whole host of, of levers we can pull and work collectively in a more integrated way that's challenging because as a system it's very compl complex um i think the the biggest thing that i'm sort of picking up from the Wong doncaster plan you know health priorities local authority priorities um, a chime in the same thing really it's around addressing health inequalities and it's a commitment to community engagement so I think if we have that in the back of his head in terms of everything we do in terms of service reviews um, you know exit planning um, that's that's I think that's that could be a, an added arsenal uh, to what to what we're doing sorry last question then from me before others might want to come in obviously you report to the board but I'm assuming that there is a working group or forum or working groups that, that are making the decisions about the continuation of the funding and where, I think there was 617 or something, was there, that we still need to allocate. Um, and I suppose it's the question is about how we all as partners and that use that lived experience to develop those priorities, therefore fund the services that do invest to save and make the difference. Yeah, so um, JCOG, Joint Commissioning Operational Group, is the is the forum. Um, that sort of feeds into um, Joint Delivery Group and then Place Committee. But ultimately, um, responsibility sits within Health and Wellbeing Board. So from a government perspective, you know, when we submit returns or end of year reporting or new year planning, um, it needs Health and Wellbeing Board approval. So I suppose that's the nuance really in that the, the reporting goes through you know um, you know a joint health and local authority led approach but ultimately responsibility sits with health and wellbeing board okay has anybody else got any questions yeah thank you Jay. it's not it's not really a question it's just a comment in terms of Phil identified I think the two priority areas that the fund is aimed at and I think if we reflect on last year and the sort of challenges we had through winter, which is often when some of these services come under the most extreme pressure, um, we had, um, and the data is the data to be um, uh, challenged and examined, we had 180 people in hospital who were clusters um, medically fit for discharge, and that's out of a total bed base of 670, so you can sort of do the maths. Um, and that translates in practice to the impact on people's lives and also sort of the right place, right um, uh, care um, scenario. Now that's dropped at the moment, so there's 113 on that list, um, which obviously is still a significant figure. But what I think we do have to be cited on is that how we spend this money um, over the year, but also how we spend it in preparation for autumn and winter will translate into the front door pressures at A&E, the number of ambulances that we're able to process quickly and get patients into bed. So I think we've all got a vested interest in making sure that what we're doing here, as Phil indicated, is with more to do, but we do the right things because we have to do the right things in the short term that allow us that headspace to get ahead. Because if this winter we have the same sorts of challenges around those services, then last winter we spent four million pounds of budget we didn't have in terms of opening up additional facilities and services and we just don't have that four million pounds this year in the tight fiscal position we find ourselves so i would you know commend spending it wisely in the way that we've described to absolutely address those two twin aims whilst we sort of 
get the services and the systems in a post-pandemic world probably more fit for purpose than they were last year? I completely support that. We, we, we need to be clear about how the Better Care Fund works. We also need to bear in mind that um, there's much more money outside the Better Care Fund than inside it. Um, and quite a lot of the effort required to um, help people leave hospital will be in Richard's own budgets, will be in IC ICB budgets, will be in my wider budgets, and so on and so forth. So we need to make sure that the Better Care Fund is working in its best possible way, but we need to see it in a way as holding a mirror up as well to what the wider things that we're doing across our partnership um, in a balanced way, because from the moment of admission, there needs to be effort to help people leave at the right time, um, so on and so forth. So, and, and obviously prior to admission is helping people not have to come in in the first place. So it's, it's probably seeing it in that context, but being a bit clearer about the BCF, other places have decided that they want their better care fund to be much bigger because they want to bring greater transparency into a range of other services to say well how are we spending the Doncaster pound more broadly in the most joined up way so we've got those options as well as a, as a place to think about okay and is that what Jay Cog is discussing and picking up those I think it's probably a, a place committee type discussion probably a bit bigger than Jay Cog I would think okay so as a health and well-being board we're assured that those discussions are taking place very similar conversation that we had at our place committee last Friday and we've got our finance directors across each of our organisations in rooms together looking at how we can better prioritise. So in terms of what you wanted from us Michael it's that we acknowledge the sign off is anybody objecting to signing off the report? No? Okay. That we note the Section 75 agreement between the South Yorkshire Integrated Care Board will be signed no later than 31st of October, and that this will include details of the new national conditions and metrics that you alluded to, and that, the, that we've reviewed the progress of the Doncaster's BCF plan and evaluation of performance at future meetings. So, again, it's working with Louise about when you come back with that evaluation that will be obviously be influenced by the work of JCOG. Have you got what you need from us, Michael, in that? Yeah? Anybody else want to comment? I'm a bit confused about this one, I'll be honest, but it's the end of the meeting. So I'll have discussions with people afterwards. Okay, so that brings us to the information only, which is the Health Protection Assurance Group minutes. But I'm aware that there was an announcement recently about vaccinations. I don't know if you just wanted to make people aware, Anthony. Yeah, yeah just very quickly. So as it as it yesterday, um, we had notification that um, that uh, there's the Department of Health and Social Care and the UK Health Security Agency have um, identified a variant to the COVID nineteen. Um, um, Thank you, Nabil. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Of, yeah. It's a, uh, the, uh, um, anyway, the, the, the point of, of, of my comment was is that um, what is not sure yet is that the current vaccines are are um, are um, God, what's wrong with me? Effective against uh, against against against, um, against that. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring forward the flu and the COVID nineteen vaccination program um, chair, and that will start on the. 11th of September for our most vulnerable um, residents, particularly um, vaccination for care home residents and those who are housebound. And we will open up um, the vaccination programme to all cohorts from the, 18th, from the 18th of September. Just to quickly refresh people's memory of the cohorts, it's residents in care homes for older adults, all adults aged 65 or over, persons um, aged six months to 64 years in a clinical risk group, frontline health and social care workers and persons who are 12 to 64 year old who are household contacts um, of people who are immunosuppressed um, and persons aged 16 to 64 who are carers in care homes and older adults. The flu, um, the, 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 the flu cohorts will also, um, as, as previously, include children, um, two to three year olds on the 31st of August and primary school children um, from reception to year six. Um, we're currently looking at our model for delivery in Doncaster, which will be a combination of uh, GP practices, primary care networks in community settings, and also community pharmacies. 
um, and we're also working with them um, with our hospitals um, to see if there's anything more we can do around vaccination of frontline staff as well. So this is a big campaign that's been brought forward. There'll be a lot of publicity of this over the next few weeks and um, we'll get it done as we always do. Um, the, other, the last thing I wanted to mention, Rachel, um, I know close to your heart, is that we make sure that we take the vaccine out to some of our underserved communities um, um, so that we're getting it out there and, um, so that there's the right access for people. Unless anybody's got any questions further. No, not question, but just to add to what Anthony said, uh, there was a webinar last, last night um, to kind of uh, highlight why the the vaccination program is brought, being brought early to kind of manage the risk of the new variant that is suspected. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So that does bring us to the end of the meeting. Thank you so much for all your contributions. Taking on Richard's point, what he said in terms of, you know, it sometimes must feel like when you come to this board, you all go away with lots of actions as well as doing business as usual. I think as a board collectively, we just have a desire, as you all do, to do more and invest in the right appropriate way. So I wouldn't want anyone to leave feeling, oh goodness me, more actions, you know, they don't recognize the work that we're doing. We do, and um, it frustrates me greatly when I see national governments telling us that we need to improve and innovate on what we're doing. Um, and I often say you should come to our health and wellbeing board to see the way that we do that day in, day out, 365 days a year. So thank you for everything you do. Um, our next meeting is sometime, uh, 9th of November at 9 o'clock, um, and I'll make sure we finish on time. So thank you very much, everybody. Rachel, just on the November meeting, can I talk to you outside about the conversation earlier? Because I'm wondering if the January meeting might be a good one for the Fairness and Wellbeing Commission, because it's really light, whereas the November one's really busy. So I'll talk to you about that outside. Thanks.